Hello, my dear students, and welcome back to Victory Batch. And I am your Diksha Ma. So we are going to start with the chapter body fluids and circulation. So in the previous lecture, I came across a lot of comments, and uh, you were saying, "Ma'am, please uh, do these thing in more details and so on." So just I'm taking care of everything that how the chapter should go on, and we are definitely taking care of the NCERT. So guys, trust me. Whatever I am providing you, if you'll just uh, read the things each and everything from my notes and uh, from uh, the lecture you will see that every pyq your previous year question is you know an easy go for you so whenever you have to see now if, if uh, this is sufficient from neat point of view just do one thing after attending the lecture very seriously and making notes of that lecture just go and solve the pyq's previous year question also today i have added a very important thing and new thing in my lectures that i will be covering all the ncrt topics or the clips of ncrt i have i have taken some little screenshots of ncrt and i'll be discussing that with you because from this exam we got to know that ncrt lines are very important why because they have just picked the lines of ncrt and they are straight away in the exam so why not to just do it in the class only because i know you uh, most of you find it very difficult to read ncrt or you find it boring but do not worry when i am here so let's get started with this chapter body fluids and circulation with your diksha ma'am so you can ask anything in the comments but that should be relevant and do not feel like that oh that's a teacher no nothing like that i'm just like your elder sister so treat me like that with respect and a lots of love will be given to you in return with the lots of knowledge so don't worry so we are a team now let's get started with this chapter and make sure today we will finish it very nicely have a pen have a piece of paper have your brain and get started all right so first of all we'll start with the blood so the entire chapter is divided into two things because the name of the chapter is body fluids and circulation so we will be discussing about a connective tissue here that's your blood and obviously the another body fluids of your body that's lymph guys in your body we have two body fluids one is blood another is lymph right and the entire circulation of this fluid is taking place in the system or in the organs which is heart and blood vessel so in this chapter what we are going to study in this chapter what we are going to study all right so there's a green page well, let's make it dark <laughs> so in this chapter what we are going to study is first of all your body fluids in body fluids as i have already mentioned you the blood and lymph and everything related with the blood its composition what it does and what are the various things about these cells and everything right or any composition of the blood second thing is your circulatory system how this blood uh, moves in your body so in the circulatory system we have organs what are these organs guys you must have heard of tuk 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 and that is your heart and second are your blood vessels okay so this is all about this chapter along with the disorders and physiology but everything okay so now we are going to start with the very interesting one that's blood and make sure one question will definitely be definitely be there in the exam in the neat exam from the blood or whether you are going for any exam there will definitely be a question from blood right okay any exam means if uh, the blood is in the syllabus <laughs> okay don't take me wrong so here blood what is a blood basically it's a fluid connective tissue remember we have done the connective tissue in detail guys if you remember we have done the connective tissue in detail and in the connective tissue what have we done we have done that there are different types of connective tissue loose dense and specialized in the specialized one uh, there was a connective tissue uh, which was <clears throat> which was your uh, endoskeleton and then there was your fluid connective tissue so this one belongs to fluid connective tissue so if i talk about this this is your body fluid and it performs a number of functions number of functions let's see what it is made up of so you can see in a lot of animations and the images this is how it's a blood vessel and blood is flowing in it so what blood is made up of you all know what's the color of a blood it's red in color it's red in color all right so it's okay all right it's red in color 
okay so if i want to see what's present in the blood what i will do i will take a small beaker or what, what you say test tube like structure and put a sample of blood in it and i will centrifuge it so when i'll centrifuge my blood sample i will see this thing okay so you know what is a centrifuge it's like a washing machine kind of a thing and when it runs very fast it spins all the things they settle down according to its sedimentation rate the same you do in the botany so here you will see the blood is made up of 55 percent is plasma and 45 percent the other things in that 45 you can see one percent or less than one percent of this white color buffy coat and in this white color buffy coat you have another component of the blood which is your cells okay also there are certain cells which are erythrocyte let's simplify these things so if i talk about the blood guys the blood is made up of plasma the plasma constitute around 55 percent part and then you have the other elements known as formed elements and formed elements can be cells or they can be the fragments of cell these formed elements they can be cells or they can be fragment fragment means pieces pieces of cell right and these formed elements they constitute around 45 percent and they are your erythrocytes your wbcs or white blood cells also known as leukocytes sometimes in leukocyte they use c and sometimes they use k so in this diagram you can see k and then we have thrombocytes known as platelets known as platelets so out of this 45 percent they are you know making this one percent of this buffy coat so by this you got to know that in the formed elements the major amount of section or the percentage is of your erythrocytes so there can be a very common question that can be asked which is the most abundant formed element which is the most abundant cell in your blood you will say erythrocytes right so here uh, thrombocytes they're also known as platelets i'm writing it here okay guys all right so this is very important so what blood is made up of what blood is made up of? The blood is made up of 45% formed elements and 55% plasma. 55% plasma and 45% formed elements. Okay, cool enough. All right. So, let's see what plasma have. So, if we talk about the plasma in detail, 90 to 92%, 90 to 92% is water. Whereas, 8 to 10 percent is plasma proteins is plasma proteins so why do we need water you know doctors always say drink a lot of water you will get dehydrated or you know nowadays it's also said that have a lot of water for glowing skin and so so why they are saying these things the reason behind this is that because the water is a medium of all the chemical reaction in the blood water is a medium because if it will be fluid it can easily get transported second in the water a number of substances can get dissolved right so water is a medium of chemical reaction medium of chemical reaction like in chemistry you have to you know uh, dissolve a lot of things or you have to uh, for any reaction you have to uh, form water in the powder state if the chemical is in the powder state you mix it in the water so it's like a medium second it helps to dissolve substances it helps to dissolve substances now what are these substances or solutes what are these things that dissolves see whenever you eat something like you ate carbohydrates proteins so where does they go from your gut they enter into your blood they enter into your blood so these substances are like your nutrients because nutrients are always in the transient state transient means they're moving from one place to another like you ate the food it goes to the blood and from blood it will go to the tissues so they need to be transported second thing gases like in breathing and exchange of gases we have done that three percent of oxygen is present in the dissolved form whereas your uh, other co2 if you talk about that seven percent of co2 transport in the form of dissolved form in plasma right then we have a lot of ions what are these ions like calcium ions magnesium ions sodium ions 
potassium ions or bicarbonate ions and some act as buffers buffer we have dibasic and monobasic ions so certain dibasic or monobasic ions are also present guys they act as buffer now what a buffer that helps in maintaining ph see guys the ph of your blood is slightly alkaline right why do we need that why because it's set ph is there and we need buffer to set that ph so buffers are something these are the ions which will maintain the ph you know there can be certain substances which can increase the ph like imagine if the co2 concentration increases is in blood it will form h positive ion and ph will go down so at that point these buffers will come for the rescue and make the ph quite alkaline and set it up right so these are certain substances apart from that we have waste also like urea and all so these substances are present in the dissolved form what about the plasma proteins very important so we have different types of plasma proteins one is your albumin Albumin is the most abundant. Its function is to maintain the osmotic balance. It maintains the osmotic balance. It's the smallest protein. It's most abundant and smallest. So whenever, if I say the amount of albumin reduces in your blood, at that time you can feel your body as bloated or you can feel that you are getting fatter. The reason can be because the albumin is less. Okay, let me uh, explain you the concept. Imagine if I say, this is your blood. In the blood, you have a lot of albumin protein. Alright, so this is hypertonic. So anything that is hypertonic, it has a tendency to have a lot of water in it. In it. Like we say, na, if this is hypotonic solution and this is hypertonic, so where will water go? Water will go towards the hypertonic. This is what we say. So if the blood have abundant albumin, there will be uh, a lot of water that can be retained in the blood. Okay. Now, imagine, imagine on the another condition, if this is blood and the albumin reduces, there is low albumin. That means the conditions are becoming hypotonic here albumin is there so the blood is hypertonic so it will have a lot of water from the outside or the water will remain here okay but if albumin concentration gets less it will become hypertonic it will become hypertonic so all its water all its water will go to the adjoining tissues and tissues will swell Tissues will swell and when the swelling of tissues occur, you feel bloated, right? Just sometimes, you uh, you know, your feet get swell or when whenever you feel like nah, your face is swelling, have a lot of water, have a lot of water and start having a lot of protein. Your body will react in a different way, right? So this is how the certain things are very much important in your body. So that's the first protein, that's albumin, which helps in maintaining osmotic balance. How? Now you know that. Second type of a protein is your globulin globulin protein they are of three types one is alpha second is beta and third is gamma all right alpha beta and gamma alpha and beta they are transport proteins they help in transport of substances see blood as a base of water but the things which are lipid soluble that means they are not water soluble they are not friends with water like fats are not friends with water or fat soluble vitamins they are not friends with water so they need someone to pick them and you know uh, they can move across water for example if you do not know swimming so either you need a tube water tube or that air that has air in it or might be you must be needing a friend that will hold your hand and take you throughout the swimming pool right just like that you are that friend who knows swimming and your another friend does not know swimming so you are working as alpha and beta globulin and you are just holding the hand of that friend and you're moving across the swimming pool right so they are transport proteins whereas gamma gamma globulin 
forms immunoglobulin what are immunoglobulin immunoglobulin is the another name for antibodies and guys you know what is the function of antibodies it helps in defense that means it will protect you it's a part of your immunity right then we have the another proteins which are blood clotting proteins prothrombin and fibrinogen see for blood clotting we'll be studying blood clotting in this chapter only we need certain proteins and clotting factors right so basically these proteins are also clotting factor for for making blood clot we need clotting factors so they act as a clotting factor so we say that all these clotting factors are present in the dissolved form in the plasma fine these are always present in the inactive form they are present in inactive form these are blood clotting proteins what are these blood clotting proteins and they are always present in which form inactive form that means they are they no longer can work in this form they need to be converted into another form then they will become active like prothrombin will be converted into thrombin and fibrinogen will be converted into fibrin that is its active state and now they are present always in in in, in the inactive form why they are in inactive because if you leave them in the active form in the blood they will keep on forming clots on those places where you do not want the clot formation we only need clot formation at places where there is you know certain injury or so we do not want the clot formation on those places where there is no injury rather that can cause blockage so we don't need that so that's about your uh, proteins and plasma let's talk about the ncrt as i promised you so the first is Blood is a special connective tissue consisting of fluid matrix, plasma and formed elements because it's a fluid connective tissue. So what type of matrix it will be having fluid? Why? Because it has water. Plasma is a straw colored. What is a straw color? It's a light yellow shade, right? Viscous fluid consisting nearly 55% of the blood, 90 to 92% of plasma is water and protein constitutes 6 to 8% in them. Fibrinogen, globulin and albumins are the major proteins. Fibrinogens are needed for blood clotting or coagulation of blood. Globulins primarily are involved in defense mechanism and albumins help in osmotic balance. This is very important. So you need to understand their function. Fibrinogen, blood clotting, globulin, defense mechanism, albumins, osmotic balance. Plasma also contains small amount of minerals like sodium, calcium, magnesium, SCO3 and uh, chloride ions. Glucose, amino acid and lipids, all these are what? These are nutrients are also present in the plasma as they are in always transient in the body. Factors for coagulation or clotting of blood are also present in the plasma in the inactive form. In fact, fibrinogen is also the clotting factor. Plasma without the clotting factor is serum. So if I... If I take away the formed elements from the blood, then what will be left? That will be plasma. Okay. So I say blood minus formed element is equal to plasma. Okay. Now, if I take away all the clotting factors, what are clotting factors? These are certain proteins or ions which are responsible for blood clotting. So if I take away all the clotting factors away from the plasma, whatever left behind will be serum. You know, this is also important. From here, the questions can be asked. So guys, please, you know, each, each and every line of NCRT is very important. Very important. Okay. All right. So that's about it. All right. Next, we'll start with the RPC. So red blood cells. Guys, so what I want to tell you, if you are watching these lectures very carefully or not what you have to do is just prepare yourself by just watching all the videos especially of biology and then i have a lot of surprise for you uh, yes I, there is a surprise i will not reveal it right now but that will be really helpful for you for your neat exam for the preparation and it's going to be really very great and you will be having a full prep of neat on this youtube channel there will be no cost at all we are doing a really hard work for you guys so that you can get quality of education and free of cost. So I'll be giving you or providing you some other things and they will be really, 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 very helpful for you apart from that victory batch. 
that will be a part of it but uh, you know some extra thing some extra thing that i want to give you guys so that you can uh, have a better preparation but only one thing in return that i want is whatsoever lectures we are providing you just solve them or do them uh, you know watch them very seriously make notes learn things nicely read ncrt also and a lot of things are coming in the way okay all right so rbc red blood cells rbc is red blood cells or erythrocytes all right these are the most abundant that means maximum amount of the cells in the blood is rbc how much they are around 5 million to 5.5 per mm cube of blood so if i take only mm cube of blood all right so in that one mm cube of blood i can find this much cells see and we have around five liter of blood see right they do not have nucleus they are biconcave in shape you can see what's the shape biconcave it's you know depressed on the center and if i see through the sides you can see or you can see their shape is like that depressed on the center right and these they do not have the nucleus you know what happen whenever the rbcs are formed where are they formed they're formed in the bone marrow so where are the rbcs formed they're formed in the bone marrow red bone marrow red bone marrow it's the location or the site of erythropoiesis and in fact hemopoiesis what is hemopoiesis formation of blood right when i'm saying it's the site of erythropoiesis erythro means rpc we are talking about poiesis means formation so that means i'm talking about formation of rbc formation of rbc fine so rbcs are formed in bone marrow red bone marrow now you must be thinking ma'am where is red bone marrow so if this is your bone so here on the ends of the bone you got these tissues inside them and these are nothing but red bone marrow so when the rbc is forming or it's in the process of formation in red bone marrow the rbc is present in the nucleated condition imagine this is the immature rbc immature rbc it has nucleus in it okay so when it undergoes maturation its nucleus and in fact it's another organelle mitochondria is taken out during maturation the nucleus and the the what mitochondria is taken out and in spite of that another organelle or not the organelle in fact another protein another protein is given to the rbc that is hemoglobin so why nature has taken out the nucleus from rbc so that it can give a lot of space to the hemoglobin and hemoglobin carries oxygen fine guys okay so for maturation we need vitamin b12 yes we need vitamin b12 and we also need vitamin b9 we also need vitamin b9 so if someone does not take vitamin b12 and 9 in abundance or they are deficient of these vitamins they will suffer from anemia what is anemia low rbc count okay so now now you know why vitamin b12 or vitamin b in uh, the whole because there are number of vitamin b's one it is three then five seven nine twelve right so all these are very much important for your body anyways next they have a red colored iron containing com complex protein called hemoglobin so what's the color of hemoglobin red what does it contains iron we'll also do this uh, structure in detail though we already have done it in the breathing and exchange but no worries i'll show you that in detail here then a healthy individual has how much amount of hemoglobin 12 to 16 gram per 100 ml of blood how much 12 to 16 gram hemoglobin per 100 ml of blood so if i take 100 ml of your blood if i have around 12 to 16 gram of hemoglobin you are completely healthy okay 
Now, these RBC, because they do not have nucleus, they cannot multiply, they cannot live their life nicely. So they have a lifespan. Their lifespan is for 120 days. Once it is formed from that day, it will go into the blood. The back counting start and it can only live for 120 days. Then it is sent to the organ known as spleen and in this organ spleen, it is present behind the stomach. It is destroyed. So you call spleen as graveyard of RBC. What is graveyard? The place you are, uh, the place where you dig the dead bodies of person, right? The funeral happens. So that's the graveyard. So for RBC, the graveyard is spleen. Fine. Okay. Let's talk about the structure of hemoglobin. So you can see these green and blue color chain. What are these? These are the chains of globin portion. Okay, if you remember, I've told you the hemoglobin is made up of two portion. One is heme, another is globin. The globin portion contains amino acid chains. Amino acid chains. It's quite obvious it will have a chain of amino acid because it's a protein. So there are two types of chain, two alpha and two beta. So you can see example these blue one are the alpha ones and green one are the beta one. Right now inside every chain are present heme portion. This is heme portion and every heme portion contains one iron. Right. So there are total how many heme in one hemoglobin there are four heme portion and one heme contains one iron. And one iron binds to one oxygen. You can see here, this entire structure is heme. You can see this portion is green. Uh, okay, let me just draw it with other colors. This portion is having on it iron. This entire is heme. Okay. Now, on the iron, there are present two oxygen molecules, two oxygen molecules. So I can simply say that here, guys, that one hemoglobin can bind to four oxygen molecules. Is this clear or not? One hemoglobin can bind to, bind to four oxygen molecules, right? So this is how hemoglobin it looks like. It's very important. Why? Because it helps in the transport of gases, not just oxygen, CO2 also. If you remember, 20 to 25 percent of CO2 moves in the form of carbamino hemoglobin, bind form with the hemoglobin, right? Okay, let's talk about erythropoiesis. What is erythropoiesis? Formation of RBC. Formation of RBC. What is the site of erythropoiesis? It occurs in red bone marrow. In red bone marrow. Okay, so if somehow there is a low RBC count in the body, what is that condition known as? This is known as anemia. This is known as anemia. Do not forget this, okay? This is known as anemia. The cause of anemia can be anything. It can be due to vitamin deficiency. Vitamin deficiency, like vitamin, I have already told you, vitamin B12 and B9. And it can also occur due to iron deficiency. It can also occur due to iron deficiency. Okay, guys. All right. Let's move further and read the NCRT lines because they're very important. Okay. So let's revise it first. Then we'll read it. First of all, which is the most abundant cell in the body, uh, in the blood, not in the body, in the blood, RBC. What's the count? 5 to 5.5 million per mm cube of blood. Second, do they have nucleus? No. Do they have mitochondria? No. Why? Because during maturation, during their erythropoiesis, the nucleus is taken out, right? And um, why they are taken out? Because we want a lot of space for hemoglobin. Why we need hemoglobin? Because hemoglobin carries oxygen. Next, what is the shape? Biconcave. And hemoglobin's color is red. What is it is made up of? One heme portion, another globin. Heme contains iron, globin contains amino acid chain. What, how, what, what is the amount of hemoglobin in healthy person? 12 to 16 gram per 100 ml of blood. Okay. How, what is the lifespan of RBC? 120 days and then it is taken back into the spleen where it is destroyed. That's why the spleen is graveyard. Next. Okay. So, if the RBC count decreases, what do you call it as? Anemia. Why it can occur to a person? Because a person is having vitamin or iron deficiency. Which vitamin? B vitamin. Especially 9 and 12. Okay. All right. Let's read NCRT. Erythrocyte, leukocyte and platelets are collectively called 
formed elements and they constituent how much percentage 45 percentage erythrocytes or rbc are the most abundant of all the cell in the blood a healthy man on an average have 5 million to 5.5 million of rbc if someone asks you out of male and female who have the the more amount of rbc then what will you say definitely male why the reason is because females undergo menstruation due to that you have low count of rbc yes girls so yes boys we do have low count of rbc than you see <laughs> so next rbc are formed in the red bone marrow in the adults rbc is a devoid of nucleus devoid means they do not have and is most uh, of the mammals are biconcave in shape they have a red color iron containing complex protein called hemoglobin hence the color and name of these cells a healthy individual has 12 to 16 gram of hemoglobin how much 12 to 16 gram in every 100 ml of blood these molecules play a significant role in transport of respiratory gases so whenever we have to transport gases hemoglobin is there for rescue RBC have average lifespan of 120 day and it is destroyed in the spleen that is the graveyard. I hope you have learned it nicely about RBCs. Okay, next. Next we have WBCs. The WBC is another name or the full form first of all is white blood cells and they are also known as leukocytes and sometimes you also write it like leukocytes. So they are white in color. Why? Because they do not have hemoglobin. So they are colorless because they do not have hemoglobin. And yes, they also have nucleus. And total amount is 6000 to 8000 per mm cube of blood. Leukocytes are generally short-lived. Comparison to the RBC, they are short-lived. Because, you know, they have a different roles to perform. That's why they are short-lived. You know, any person who plays with the dangerous situations right or they are usually short-lived only so they are the one that fights all the bacteria so we use sometimes call them as in the lower classes they are the soldiers of your body right so if i talk about the wbcs they are divided into two categories one are granulocytes and another are a granulocyte now why have we uh, you know, uh, distinguish them like that. That depends upon a small, small granules made up of proteins. Imagine this is a granulocyte. In this, if the cell is granulocyte, you will see these small, small granules. If the cell is not granulocyte, you will see the clear cytoplasm. So, in the granulocyte, granules are present granules are present in the agranulocyte granules absent okay now so agranulocyte or granulocyte they have the three categories of cell and agranulocyte they have two categories so in the agranulocyte we first of all have eosinophil cells which cells eosinophils then we have neutrophils and then we have basophils then we have basophils right so eosinophils then we have neutrophils and then we have basophils all right guys now let's talk about the uh, granulocyte in granulocyte we have lymphocytes and then we have monocyte then we have monocyte fine so let's talk about their percentage first so what is their percentage if i talk about if we start from the lymphocyte the lymphocyte they're around 20 to 25 percent monocytes are around six to eight percent in the entire blood the basophils they're 0 0.5 to 1 percent neutrophils 60 to 65 percent and if i talk about the eosinophils they are around two to three percent this is quite important guys it's really important so you know the direct questions can be asked like they will make a table and from table they will give you percentage and name and you have to find out what, what is the percentage of which type of wbc okay now so let's start and talk about what do they do if i talk about eosinophils eosinophils they are anti they are anti allergic and anti inflammatory 
they are anti allergic and anti inflammatory for example if a mosquito bites to you if a mosquito bites to you you get the dry red color bump that's inflammation you get that red color bump that is inflammation so whenever a mosquito bites the cell that comes rushing towards that is your eosinophil so it will go to the places where you have uh, some allergies or inflammation okay then neutrophils they are phagocytic cell what are phagocytic cells that will that will okay phagocytic cells there are two uh, type of wbcs which are uh, phagocytic one is your neutrophils another are your monocytes so i'm writing on both first of all then i'll explain you what is phagocytosis for example if this is your neutrophil or monocyte right and uh, this is your microbe so neutrophil or monocyte what they will do they will change their shape and start to engulf this microorganism in them how by making pseudopodia like that of amoeba right so they will start to move so from here we got to know that wbcs have a property that they can move and the movement of wbc is amoeboid movement which movement amoeboid so wbcs they move like amoeba amoeboid movement is seen in all wbcs but phagocytosis is seen in what is phagocytosis that wbcs will move and they will take away their arm and engulf the microbe if this is a microbe they will engulf it if you do not understand it let me just uh, show you the intermediate diagram also for example this was your wbc then it uh, formed a pseudopodia like this around microbe right and then engulf it so this property is known as phagocytosis and this is seen by or it is shown by monocytes or another is your yes neutrophils neutrophils okay all right next okay that's in crt basophils so basophils are the one that will cause inflammation they are always responsible for inflammation so that means they are working opposite to eosinophil so they secrete three things heparin serotonin and histamine these three things especially histamine wherever in your tissues histamine comes that will definitely causes inflammation that will definitely causes inflammation okay then lymphocyte you all know lymphocyte is responsible for immune response they are of two type one is b cell lymphocyte are of two type one is b cell another is t cell the b cell forms antibodies b cell forms anti bodies and t cell directly kill the pathogen or whenever you have a graft rejection what is graft rejection for example uh, a person took kidney from the another one so that kidney will be recognized by these t cell and they will kill it because they will think that is a foreign tissue that is a tissue that came from another body okay so this is how these cells perform various function now how will you identify these cells let's see so imagine you have monocyte you have neutrophil okay let me just make the diagrams here so in a granulocyte in a granulocyte you have certain cells and in the granulocyte you have certain cell one difference is the point of granules if a cell have granules it's a granulocyte if a cell does not have it say granulocyte so you can just um, first of all classify into these now imagine if it has granules how to know whether it is your eosinophil whether it is your neutrophil or if it is a basophil all will have the granules that's for sure because they are granulocyte so filfils are the one which are granulo ones okay so if it is a cell with a lot of granules but its nucleus is like this it is bilobed if the nucleus is bilobed so bilobed nucleus is a characteristic feature of your eosinophils now if i have a cell okay and the shape of the nucleus in this cell is s shape like this it will be a basophil if it has different types of forms 
sometimes another sometimes another different different types of morphologies there never it is same but it is multi lobed it is multi lobed then it will definitely be definitely will be your neutrophil so we call neutrophils as pmnl we call them as pmnl what is the full form polymorpho that means many type of shape many type of morphology nucleus the nucleus is of many types of shape polymorpho nucleo leucocyte because its shape is always different whereas in the basophil the shape is s shaped okay now how to identify whether it's a lymphocyte or a monocyte very simple in lymphocyte you will have a cell with the round nucleus Whereas in monocyte, you have a cell with this kidney shape. Kidney shaped nucleus or bean shape, right? Kidney shape or bean shape. Nucleus. All right. So that's how you can identify different types of leukocyte. So let's see uh, and read the NCRT. It's huge, uh, but don't worry, I'm here. So here, Leukocytes are known as white blood cell as they are colorless due to lack of hemoglobin. Why WBCs are white? Because they don't have hemoglobin. So they lack hemoglobin. They are nucleated and are relatively lesser in number which average 6 to 8,000 per mm cube of blood. What was the number of RBC? 5 to 5.5 million per, uh, per mm cube of blood. This is 6,000 to 8,000. Leukocytes are generally short-lived. We have two main categories. One is granulo, another is acranulo. Neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, they come under the category of granulocyte, fill, fill. So anything that will fill, it must have something. <laughs> That's granules, okay? While lymphocyte and monocyte are the agranulocyte, neutrophils are most abundant 60 to 65% of the total WBC, and basophil 0. 0.5 to 1. And uh, the neutrophil and monocyte, 6 to 8%, they are phagocytic okay so monocyte is 6 to 8 percent and they both are phagocytic which destroy foreign organism entering the body basophil secrete histamine serotonin heparin involved in inflammatory reaction eosinophil will resist infection and are also associated with allergic reaction they are responsible for creating allergies lymphocytes are 20 to 95 percent and our BNT forms, both BNT lymphocytes are responsible for immune response of the body. Very important, you need to learn the uh, various function. From here the question, basically that's the point from where the question is asked. So I'm putting a star. So there is a rule, wherever I put a star, that means that's important. Okay, so here there are two types of your WBC, granulo and agranulo. And in A granulo, we have two lymphocyte and monocyte. In granulo, EO, NEO, neutro, and basophil. Most abundant is neutrophil, phagocytic, neutrophils, and monocyte, immune response, lymphocyte, inflammation, basophil, anti inflammatory, eosinophil. What is responsible for inflammation? Histamine, serotonin, heparin, secreted by basophils. All right, you got it? Okay, next. Next, we have a question, guys. Let's do this. Histamine, serotonin, heparin, etc. are involved in inflammatory reaction, which are secreted by, which is secreted by basophil. So, if you do not even know these substances, but you know the inflammatory reaction is, uh, it is due to basophil. You can simply mark the answer. Okay, then. Next, we have platelets. The platelets they are also known as thrombocyte. These are not cells. WBCs, white blood cells, um, and RBC, red blood cell. <clears throat> but these ones, they're not the cells. These are fragments or pieces of cell. Fragments of cells. These are what? Fragments of cell. Let me see if I have a picture of all these. I think, no, I don't have one. Okay, anyways. So these are what? Fragments of cell. So all WBC, RBC, all the cells, because hemopoiesis occurs in red bone marrow. So the formation of platelets also occurs in red bone marrow. So the only role is in the blood clotting. They are very much important in blood clotting. Okay. So then count is 1.5 lakh to 3 lakh per mm cube of blood. 
okay so that was 5 to 5.5 million the wbc was 6 to 8000 this is 1.5 to 3 lakhs so you must have heard of someone when if a person got, got dengue or dengue the platelet count decreases that's one of a symptom of the dengue okay so what happened how its a formation occurs you call it as thrombopoiesis what is thrombopoiesis formation of platelet formation of thrombocytes formation of thrombocyte so what happened in this one a large cell is formed a large cell with a large nucleus is formed and the name of a cell is mega karyocyte mega means large karyo means nucleus so a large cell with a large nucleus is formed then it undergoes fragmentation it gets destroyed and it forms biconvex it forms biconvex biconcave is like this biconvex is like this okay so it forms a biconvex structures known as platelets so if someone asks you what's the shape of the platelets you will call it as biconvex do they have nucleus no because they are the fragments of the cell so when a cell breaks no part of the cell will be having a proper nucleus so these are nothing but these are the small pieces of a large cell and you call them as platelets okay guys next platelets are also called thrombocyte are cell fragments means pieces produced from a cell mega karyocyte special cell in the bone marrow blood normally contains 1.5 to 3.5 lakh platelets per mm cube platelets can release a variety of substances most of which are responsible in coagulation or clotting of blood a reduction in the number can lead to clotting disorder which will lead to excessive lot of loss of blood from the body so if someone like in case of dengue if a person's platelet counts it's less why it's dangerous because platelets helps in blood clotting if they are not there the blood will leak the blood will leak and a person will have a lot of loss of blood fine guys so that's about your all the three cells the wbc rbc and platelets let's talk about the blood groups very important portion of this chapter let's get started so what are blood groups all right so we have studied the rbc right so this was how the rbc it looked like by concave so now on the rbc there is a present a layer of glycolipid and glycoproteins you call it as antigen what do you call it as antigen so there is a layer of glycocalyx layer of glycocalyx made up of lipids uh, and uh, carbohydrates right and sometimes proteins so this layer it act as an antigen act as an antigen all right so you must have heard that some people have a blood group some people have b blood group some have a b blood group and some have o blood group right so this uh, antigen they are special in every blood group for example if my blood group is a so i will be having a antigen what i will be having a antigen right if my blood group is b i have be having this uh, layer antigen which is b so they are of different types because they are of different types we have different types of blood groups okay and people who are of a and b blood group they both they have uh, both these type of antigens in them and those of a uh, o blood group they do not have any antigen so what happened what is antigen antigen is anything which enters into our body our immune system gets triggered and it's just, it started producing antibodies for example let me tell you an example if this is a person this person have blood group a and this is a person this person have blood group b all right so that means this person have the rbc which have b antigen and this person have rbc which have a antigen simple okay so a1 will have a antigen and this one will have b antigen now if i give now if i give b blood group to a all right so i gave the b blood group to a person for example if i am a, a i have a blood group and i receive the blood group of b type then what will happen 
so these antigens which are present on the surface of the rbc of b blood group they will be identified by the body or the immune system of a blood group person and it will produce antibodies so that means the person who have a blood group its immune system can form the antibodies against b so that means it will produce which antibody antib similarly if i gave this person the a blood group then what will happen so this person's immune system will identify the antigen which is a antigen and against it it will produce the antibody and this antibody will be anti a anti a right so the person with blood group a have a antigen on its rbcs whereas it can produce anti b antibody in its plasma as you know the antibodies are present in the plasma of the blood right similarly the person who is having blood group b have b antigen on the rbc whereas it can produce anti a antibody in the plasma fine what if what if i give another type of blood group which is a third type of blood group which is ab imagine this person is of ab blood group so ab blood group have both the antigen a as well as b antigen okay so now if the blood if the blood group which is ab type if the blood group which is ab type if this person receives the a blood group if this person receives the a blood group does its immune system uh, consider it as an foreign or as a different antigen no because it also have the a1 right because it's own we consider anything as foreign which is not similar to our body this a was not similar to the body of b that's why the b produces anti a antibody fine similarly ab if when it will receive the a blood group or if it receives the b blood group it will not produce any antibody because for the body of ab both are same because it also have the same antigen so here it will not produce any antibody so it will not produce any antibody all right now third type of a person let's talk about the third type of a person with blood group o this is a person with blood group o so the person who have blood group o its rbc have no antigen its rbc have no antigen now if it does not have any antigen and i give this type of uh, rbc to any of these three people so it's, uh, if i give the o blood group which have no antigen on its body if i give it to a b or ab will their body produce any antibody no they will not produce any antibody against it it will not produce any kind of antibody against it right but if i give this person if i give this person a or b type of the blood group definitely its body can identify the other different colors right it can its body can easily identify a and b antigen because antigens are present on their surface so here antibodies will be formed both anti a and anti b but if o blood group goes to any person's body any other person's immune system will not consider it as an foreign because o blood group does not have any antigen on its surface very simple so we say that ab they are universal recipient because as you can see it has taken the a1 also b also o also nothing happens to this person so they are universal recipient but if b1 receives a it is producing antibody right if a1 re receives b it is producing antibody but o if goes to any other person's body nothing will happen to any person can you see any antibodies on the o1 no so that means this is universal donor this is universal donor all right so you can see this chart of ncrt in the it is written the person with a blood group have a antigen produce anti a anti b antibodies in the plasma and the donors group is a and o that means person who are of a blood group and o blood group can give blood to the a person
and person with b blood group have b antigen and they produce anti a antibody and the person who can give blood to the b1 are obviously the b1 and o whereas ab is universal recipient as you can see it, uh, uh, this one can take the blood from anyone donors group means the one who can donate blood to these people right so if the if the uh, blood, uh, the person with a blood group has to have blood someone's blood for example if i my blood group is a so if i want to have someone's blood who who that can be it can be a person with a blood group or o blood group similarly o does not have an antigen but it can produce antibody and it can only take blood from the o one so this is about a and b blood group now why why cannot we give different types of blood group to the person why cannot we uh, give the person of a blood group uh, the b blood this is known as transfusion transfusion means when there is mixing of blood mixing of blood so whenever there is mixing of blood and both the blood groups are incompatible incompatible blood group what will happen so if the blood groups are incompatible if the blood groups are incompatible for example the person was of the blood group a and accidentally that person receives the b blood group then what will happen then what will happen so you also know when the person uh, gets wrong blood group the antibodies are produced what will happen next so all the rbcs of a donor's blood will be destroyed but the rbc of the persons will be normal for example if i accidentally uh, received b blood group then all the rbcs of the b1 will be destroyed not mine because mine is a my body will not uh, attack on them so as you can see here as you can see so if a person of a blood group receives b blood group then what will happen the antibodies will be formed so when the antibodies are formed when the antibodies are formed there will be clots formation this can block your filtration membrane in the kidney and other blood vessels also leading to a number of disorders and which can cause the organ damage so what happen whenever there is transfusion blood transfusion whenever there is blood transfusion of incompatible blood group of incompatible blood group antibodies are formed anti bodies are formed against donors blood or uh, blood cells right and which blood cell red blood cell and with this can cause organ damage all right okay let's move further and read this the paragraph of ncrt as you know blood of human beings differ in certain aspects through it appears to be similar various types of grouping of blood has been done two such grouping is abo and rh the one which we have done right now is abo we have not talked about this one yet okay i'm not talking it right now i will explain you in the next section right abo blood grouping is based on the presence or absence of two surface antigen chemicals that can induce immune response so what are antigen these are chemicals which can induce the immune response on the rbc namely a and b similarly the plasma of different individuals contain two natural antibodies proteins produce in response to antigen so plasma in response to the opposite blood group will also produce the antibody okay the distribution of antigens and antibody in the four groups of blood is a b ab and o they are given in the table which we have already done you probably know that during blood transfusion any blood cannot be used the blood of a donor has to be carefully matched with the blood of a recipient before any blood transfusion to avoid severe problems of clumping that is disruption of rbc when the antibody binds to rbc you call it as clumping which can further destroy the rbc the donor's compatibility is also shown in the table for example if you do not know the blood group of a person then what will you do you will give o 
right or the donors group will be o because o is universal donor you can give it to anyone okay so that's about the avo blood grouping let's talk about the rh1 now apart from a you also call it as a positive and a negative this is based on the another antigen so we have a coating of two antigen one is abo and another is positive and negative one you call it as rh incompatibility so rh is the antigen present in our body okay guys rh is another antigen so this antigen was discovered from a rhesus monkey so that's why you got the name rh any person who have rh antigen is rh positive and anyone who does not have antigen is rh negative if someone is o negative that means it does not have any antigen it does not have any antigen not even the rh not even the ab1 right if a person is o positive that means it does not have ab antigen but it have rh antigen if someone is a positive it has two type of antigen one is a antigen another is rh1 okay now so what happen if rh positive person give blood to rh positive person will there be any incompatibility no the person will easily survive what will happen if a person with rh negative give uh, give uh, blood to rh negative again nothing will happen the person will survive now what if rh negative give blood to rh positive again nothing will happen why because this does not have an antigen just like o so if the o blood group is given to any other person does that person produces any antibodies no because this has no antigen so if it enters into the person who have antigen will have no effect for example if i am a positive and if i get a blood group a negative then my body will not react at all because a blood group is same same and it does not have an antigen but i have the antigen so my body has no problem but if vice versa occur if vice versa occurs rh positive is given to rh negative then there can be a problem then there will be a problem for example if i give blood if i am a positive i give blood to a negative the person who has taken my blood will be in a problematic situation why because my rbc have the antigen and when it goes to the person's body the person's body will produce antibodies now this type of a case is seen in the uh, rh compatibility between mother and fetus if mother is rh negative and the fetus is rh positive then comes the rh incompatibility that means the blood is not compatible right remember the mother is negative and uh, the fetus is very positive fetus is very positive mother is negative at that time what happened imagine this is the first baby imagine the mother got pregnant for the first time mother is rh negative and the fetus is definitely going to be rh positive why because positive antigen is dominant and the father is positive so always father have a dominant allele so always the fetus will be positive whether it's first baby or second baby so first baby during the time of first baby the gestation or the development in the or the development of the fetus goes very normal development normal okay this is placenta this is what placenta you all know what is placenta placenta is a barrier between mother and fetus uh, it also act as an organ which will supply the needs from mother to the fetus for example mother eats a food and goes to the fetus and that is due to this placenta okay placenta helps to passage of or passage of substances so during the first baby the development goes fine for example uh, let's take a name ram and sham so ram is the first baby and ram when was in the womb of the mother the development of ram was very normal but when the delivery of uh, during the delivery of ram what happened or during the delivery of the first baby what happened their blood get exposed during development there is no space or location where both the bloods are meeting we say during development mothers and fetus blood they never get mix up never mother and fetus blood they never get mix up they only get mix up during delivery so when the delivery of the first baby occurs there is mixing of blood there is mixing of blood 
so when the blood mixes the rh positive of the fetus goes inside the mother and mother's rh negative go inside the fetus so fetus will not produce any antibody because fetus is receiving rh negative and it does not have any antigen but when fetus rh positive enters inside the mother now mother will start it producing antibodies and this is igg type of antibodies these are very small antibodies smallest antibodies and they can easily pass through the placenta so mother's body has produced anti rh antibodies anti rh antibodies okay so anti rh antibodies have been produced in mother's blood on exposure of blood of the first baby during delivery now mother got pregnant for the second time for the second time now there is the second baby now again the second baby is also rh positive and mother is same rh negative and mother's body already have antibodies now what will happen during developmental phase of this baby these antibodies because they are very small they can easily pass through the placenta and they will kill the rh positive antigen of the baby developing baby as a result the developing baby will be having jaundice and anemia why the baby is having jaundice and anemia anemia because rbcs of the baby is going to destroy jaundice because when rbc gets destroyed they form bilirubin and biliverdin which are the a uh, responsible cause of the jaundice if you have seen or you have studied digestion and absorption you must be knowing what's the cause of jaundice okay so here what happened during first uh, delivery of the first baby the mother's blood get exposed to rh positive uh, blood group as a result mother produce antibody so now the same antibodies are present in the mother's body so when the second child come or the when the female got pregnant for the second time during uh, the development of the second child these antibodies will go inside the mother and babies because rh positive all the antibodies will cause clumping and leading to jaundice and anemia and this disease is known as erythroblastosis vitalis erythro blastosis vitalis so very common question that is asked from this topic is during rh incompatibility the mother is positive or negative always negative fetus is positive or negative always positive the erythroblastosis vitalis occurs to first child or the second child occurs to second child now how can you prevent this disease so we can give mother and antibodies which are anti rh antibodies so before the delivery of the baby right how or why because as soon as the rh positive blood group come these antibodies will kill this rbc and immune system will not produce its antibodies right for example now if the bad blood go comes into my body my immune system will recognize it and produce antibody what if before immune system recognize it i kill the rbcs by giving another antibodies this is what we do okay so let's read the ncrt guys let's read the ncrt it's important another antigen the rh antigen similar to one present in rhesus monkey is also observed on the surface of rbc of majority nearly 80% of human such individuals are called rh positive and those in whom the antigen is absent is rh negative okay uh, if rh negative person is exposed to positive blood will form a specific antibody against rh antigen so i have told you if we give rh positive antigen to negative the negative's body will produce the antibodies therefore rh group should also be matched before transfusion so whenever we are giving the blood we should always take care of positive and negative also a special case of rh incompatibility mismatching has been observed between rh negative blood of a pregnant mother with positive blood of the fetus so fetus is always positive and mother negative rh antigen of the fetus do not get exposed to rh negative blood of the mother in the first pregnancy as the two bloods are well separated by the placenta so during first pregnancy their blood are not mixing this is what first line is saying sorry their blood they are not mixing during first pregnancy next next line however during the delivery of the first child 
but when the uh, first child's delivery is there there is a possibility of exposure of maternal blood to small amount of rh positive blood from the fetus so fetus blood can easily enter into the mother in such case the mother starts preparing antibodies against rh antigen in her blood we are just talking about the first child only so the mother will start producing antibodies in case of her subsequent pregnancy now they are talking about next pregnancy subsequent means next like i have told you the second one the rh antibodies from the mother can leak into the blood of the fetus and destroy the fetal rbc so whose rbcs are going to destroy the fetal rbcs are going to destroy this can be fatal to the fetus or could uh, or could cause severe anemia and jaundice to the baby by this the baby may uh, suffer from jaundice this condition is called erythroblastosis fetalis this can be avoided by administration of anti rh antibody to the mother immediately after the delivery of the first child so for example the mother delivers the first child so we give a shot to her because now the body is going to expose with the the body is going to or the immune system is going to expose with the yes rh antigen so as soon as the blood enters we give the antibody it will kill the entire blood okay or the rpcs so this is how rh incompatibility can be dangerous all right guys so let's solve this question a special case of rh incompatibility mismatching has been observed between rh negative blood of a pregnant mother with rh positive blood of the fetus so always mother is negative and fetus is positive so this is the first case okay answer is 1 all right so that's about the incompatibility incompatibility guys so let's start with blood clotting or blood coagulation so it's also known as blood coagulation so how does the blood clotting or blood coagulation starts so what do we need for blood clotting now you must be thinking ma'am we need platelets all right that's true but for blood clotting first of all you have to have a wound right only then the blood clot will form so in your childhood we all face that one thing we fell off while playing and so and get lot of scratches here and there right and uh, the wound is there and after some time that brown color scum is formed you all have seen that that's your clot right that dried clot so how does that formed and or you must have uh, if notice whenever you get fallen off you know after some time the bleeding's also stop what's that mechanism that spot uh, that stops that bleeding let's see So, for example, you got a wound, right? So, during uh, you got or uh, you get some wound, you get basically the cut on the blood vessel. Imagine this is these are the cells of blood vessel. Okay, so when you got some wound, your blood vessels got ruptured. Imagine this blood vessel got ruptured. Okay, so the its cells got destroyed. These cells got destroyed. Now, what will happen? so when the you got wound your these destroyed tissues your destroyed tissues will produce a growth factor and that growth factor causes the beginning of your blood clotting now you got a wound the cells got destroyed they will secrete the growth factor what's the name of this growth factor thromboplastin what's the name of the growth factor thromboplastin now this will attract a lot of platelets a lot of platelets and platelet will come and temporarily block this platelets will come and temporarily blocks this but platelets cannot block it for the permanent they can only you know you you must have noticed uh, after wound the you know flow of blood reduces why because platelets come and cover the wound temporarily right so that's the platelet and platelet also secrete a growth factor platelet derived growth factor platelet derived growth factor so during wound during wound the platelet will come will temporarily block this wound site and secrete platelet derived growth factor and these damaged tissues what damaged tissues damaged tissues will secrete this growth factor known as thromboplastin okay now what will happen both these growth factors both these growth factors will lead to the activation of clotting factors activation of clotting factors 
as i have told you in your blood a number of clotting factors are present but they are always in inactive form now they will be activation of clotting factor and they form cluster and they form a cluster which will form thrombokinase so in short i can say that a lot of clotting factors they will unite and form a cluster they all get activated they form a cluster and the name of the cluster is thrombokinase now you must be thinking ma'am it has a's in it so definitely this will be the enzyme very true this is actually acting as an enzyme so all this mechanism or everything occurs in the presence of calcium ions which is also a clotting factor now this thrombokinase in the uh, presence of calcium ions only will convert your prothrombin which is the clotting factor protein into thrombin and thrombin in turn this is a question this time this question was asked thrombin will convert fibrinogen which is also inactive into fibrin and fibrin are thread like protein everything occurs in the presence of calcium ion these are calcium ion is one of a very important clotting factor without calcium ion blood clotting will not take place now these fibrins these are thread like structures and they will form a clot or coagulum and it will trap platelets it will trap platelets rbcs and other cells in it like this okay so this is what a clot is clot or coagulum let me show you how it looks like in a very beautiful diagram you can see this diagram these are rbc these are platelets and these thread like structure what are these these are fibrin fibrin these are rbcs and there will be platelets right so this is how basically it's the you know microscopic structure of that uh, clot that is formed later on what will happen after some time the epithelium of blood vessel will heal itself and this clot will dry up and goes away right for example everything was formed over here after some time these red cell these are the cells of blood vessel they will grow definitely these epithelial cell they can grow they will grow beneath it and above that will be a clot which will later on dry up and it goes and you know when i was a little child i used to scratch them up like that <laughs> right how many of you also have done this thing you know it's really gross but you know there are certain things that we used to do in our childhood and when you when you grow up and you feel we really used to do that i tell you one of my thing when i was a child i used to eat medicines yes medicines without water just like a, a, a candy i used to have medicine and do it and bite it and take it without water and you know my elder sister used to tell me and i was like seriously i used to do that <laughs> how can a child a child are, like children are always uh, you know so afraid of medicines they run away i they want to they didn't want to take it but me i used to take it like a candy and go on <laughs> so always everyone have certain things in their childhood so this is how the uh, blood clot gets formed right guys all right so now what are the various clotting factors so these are the number of clotting factor i will not advise you to learn all but at least you should know the names of them like some of them you must have heard fibrinogen prothrombin these are also the proteins thromboplastin the growth factor calcium ion these are all you have uh, heard of then anti hemophilic factor christmas factor you must be uh, you know you will get to know about them when you will study genetics in class 12 so you don't need to learn all i'm just introducing the names so that in case if it comes in any form you have an idea yes these are clotting factors okay pro convertin labile factor anti hemophilic christmas factors to what power pta and fibrin stabilizing factor this 12th is the one that comes at last here 12th is the one which comes at last after the clot is formed why because it is a clot retraction now see the clot is formed now what will happen after that the clot will get tighten up like this this is known as clot retraction so when the clot retraction occurs when clot retraction occurs there is there is serum that oozes out serum oozes out 
if you have seen you know white color or yellow color transparent fluids uh, fluid usually comes out and that is the serum so the clot retraction is tightening of the clot occurs after that the serum oozes out fine so the this was about the blood clotting guys let's solve a question which of the following ions are responsible for blood clotting very simple calcium ion have i talked about any other uh ions here in blood clotting no only calcium then why to think much put calcium <laughs> sorry all right next Form factors for coagulation or clotting of blood are present in the plasma in active form, plasma in the inactive form, RBC in the active form, both 1 and 3. Always they are present in inactive form. And where are they present? In the plasma. So answer is 2. Fine? Okay. Next, guys. Let's read this paragraph of blood clotting. Hurry up, hurry up. Open your NCRTs. So... You know that when you cut your finger or hurt yourself, your wound does not continue to bleed for a long time. Usually the blood stops flowing after some time. We all know that. Do you know why? Now you know because Diksha ma'am has told you. So blood exhibits coagulation or clotting in response to an injury or trauma. So whenever you got injury or trauma or the blood vessel gets traumatized, there is a wound and blood clotting starts. This is a mechanism to prevent excess loss of blood. So what is the purpose of basically your wound healing or uh, the blood clotting? Is that we do not want our blood to get loose because blood is a very important component of our body. It supplies oxygen and nutrients to the tissues. If it gets loses, your tissues will not get its nutrients and oxygen and they will die, you will die. Right. So uh, that's why in movies when they show, oh, there is a lot of blood loss. The person gets dizzy and, uh, you know, person is usually in coma or so is about to die. Why? Because the blood is lost. The blood will not go to the brain and brain will not get the oxygen and nutrients and the brain will be dead. Now, you would have observed a dark reddish brown scum formed at the site of cut or any injury over a period of time. It is a clot or coagulum formed mainly of a network of threads called fibrin in which dead and damaged formed elements of blood are trapped. So that scum or clot is made up of fibrins in which we have formed elements trapped. What are formed elements? RBC's platelets okay, and in the dead form. Fibrins are formed by the conversion of inactive fibrinogen in the plasma by the enzyme thrombin. So they are going in the uh, in the different manner. So how we did it? We did it in a way. We started from here. They have started it from here. So they said that clot is made up of fibrins, the thread-like, in which formed elements, the platelets and RBCs are trapped. Very good. And this fibrin is formed. Or it uh, is uh, it is it gets activated from fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is in active form, and who activated thrombin? Now next line will be the thrombin was activated by thrombokinase, and it was earlier prothrombin, right? So let's read this. Thrombin in turn are formed from another inactive substance present in the plasma called prothrombin. An enzyme complex, I told you in a cluster of enzyme, thrombokinase is required for the above reaction. This complex is formed by a series of linked enzymatic reaction, which is a cascade process involving a number of factors present in the plasma in an inactive state. So how did thrombokinase form? It is a cluster of lot of clotting factors, right? An injury or trauma stimulates the platelets in the blood to release certain factor which activate the mechanism of coagulation. So as I've told you, the platelets, they release some growth factor that initiates the blood clotting. They're going in the, uh, in the opposite manner, okay? Certain factors released by the tissues at the site of injury also can initiate coagulation. Calcium ions plays a very important role in clotting. So what are the two growth factors that play an important role in blood coagulation? One is thromboplastin, another is platelet-derived growth factor. From where does the platelet-derived growth factors come? From platelet. From where did the thromboplastin come? This comes from damaged tissue. As I have already written there, but for more surety, from damaged tissues. Okay, so this is your entire blood clotting and NCRT read very nicely. Okay, so that's about the blood clotting, guys. Let's talk about lymph. Now, what is a lymph? Lymph is your another body fluid. It is your another body fluid. So, how does a lymph is formed? First of all, imagine this is a blood vessel. And this is your lymph capillary. So like blood is flowing in the blood vessels. Like 
blood is flowing in the blood vessel lymph is flowing in the lymph vessel lymph is flowing in the lymph vessel this is lymph vessel this is blood vessel so the body fluid present inside the lymph vessel is lymph the body fluid present inside the blood vessel is blood now when blood or some of the components of the blood it leaves the blood vessel and enters into the adjoining tissues imagine some of the component of the blood it leaves it leaves the blood it leaves the blood or the components or the blood itself when it gets filtered out and it enters into the adjoining tissues this fluid you call it as interstitial fluid what do you call it as interstitial fluid okay it will not come up here let me write so when blood gets filtered out and enters into the adjoining adjoining tissues you call it as interstitial fluid now the same interstitial fluid when it enter inside the lymph vessel it is known as lymph so lymph is basically formed by the filtration of blood first it enters into the tissue there this filtered blood is known as interstitial fluid now this interstitial fluid enters into the lymph uh, capillaries you call it as a lymph there is no difference between the composition of interstitial fluid and lymph they are exactly the same the only difference is in their composition so first of all how is lymph formed lymph is formed by the filtration of blood formed by the filtration of blood fine second lymph and interstitial fluid are same the difference is only in the difference is only in the location okay third the mineral composition in lymph and blood is uh, sorry mineral composition in lymph and plasma is same lymph and plasma is same then how it is different from the blood blood have rbc lymph does not have rbc rather as comparison to blood it has more wbcs right so it has no rbc in lymph but more wbc than blood okay another thing it do have clotting factors lymph have clotting factors lymph have clotting factors as comparison to blood lymph have low oxygen have low oxygen now what's the need of a lymph okay the first question it will lead to the transient of lot of nutrients for example a lot of substances from blood will move to the lymph and later on lymph drains into the blood vessel only you heard it right lymph drains into the blood vessels how let me show you so for example if this is a person imagine this is a neck these are the shoulders these are the legs of a person okay so inside these legs are present lot of blood vessels a lot of blood vessels from these blood vessels the blood got filtered and entered into lymph capillaries now these lymph capillaries what are these guys lymph capillaries the one which we have done it earlier also the lymph capillaries takes the filtered blood known as lymph from the blood vessels and then these lymph capillaries will enter into lymphatic vessel into what lymphatic vessel so this is lymphatic vessel this lymphatic vessel will open into it will open into the big lymphatic trunk it will open into lymphatic trunk just like our blood vessels have network like veins arteries we also have pa uh, patterns and uh, you know different types of network of lymph vessels so these lymph vessels have a different you know a kind of uh, uh, network as comparison to the blood vessel how first of all we have lymph capillaries they are taking the 
filtered blood known as lymph from the blood vessel then it is sending to the lymphatic vessel then to the lymphatic trunk and this lymphatic trunk then send it to the blood vessels two blood vessels and basically these are veins what are these veins this is jugular and subclavian vein so basically you can see that the lymph got started from blood and end into the blood it started from the blood end into the blood from lymph capillary it goes to lymphatic vessel then lymphatic trunk then into the blood vessel so it started from the blood end into the blood so what blood does is whenever blood has to send things anywhere it will give it to the lymph and lymph will take it to the other organs so basically the lymph is acting as a middleman it is acting as a middleman and it will help in transport of substances also whenever there is excessive water inside the blood so blood give this excessive water to the lymph the lymph will take up and later on when blood needs it it will give it back so lymph carries excess or excessive water of blood okay another thing because it has wbcs lymphocytes it helps in defense and immune system very important as we have done in the digestion there are lacteals in the villi they are lymph vessel they also help in the help in transport and absorption of fat let me give you an example lacteals okay so this is the important function of lymph in your body they are the part of your or your of your lymphatic system it's the entire system that we have discussed here that first capillaries are taking lymph from the blood vessel these are blood vessels and then uh, this system is the one which we have drawn here just same okay so then it will go to lymphatic vessel then trunk and back to the blood so we say that the flow of lymph is unidirectional the flow of lymph is unidirectional flow of lymph is unidirectional how uni uni means one only in one direction it is not coming back to the lymph like here it started from here and goes back to this does it coming back no the blood is there the lymph is not there if it would have been that the same lymph returns to the lymphatic vessel then it would be bidirectional okay all right so that's about your lymph guys let's read this paragraph as the blood passes through the capillaries and tissues some water along with many small water soluble substances move out into the spaces between the cells of tissue leaving the larger proteins and most of the formed element in the blood vessel so it this line is saying the blood is getting filtered out coming into the tissues so what things are not getting filtered what are already present uh, they remains in the blood they are the larger proteins and most of the formed elements okay this fluid released out is called interstitial fluid or tissue fluid it has the same mineral distribution as the plasma exchange of nutrients gases etc between the blood and the cells always occur through this fluid so whenever any uh, for example the tissue has to give co2 so how the co2 will get diffused through this body fluid only okay then an elaborate network of vessels called lymphatic system collects this fluid and drains it back to the major veins so this is what we have done the lymphatic vessel will pick up this fluid and drain it to the vein which vein subclavian and jugular if you do not understand the name no problem you just now know what does this line means right the fluid present in the lymphatic system is called lymph lymph is colorless so because it does not have any rbc it has no color contains special lymphocyte which are responsible for immune response of the body lymph is also an important carrier for nutrients hormones fats are absorbed through lymph in the lacteals present in the intestinal villi and these are the functions of lymph right so so here we have finished our body fluids so let's solve this question and we'll start with the circulatory pathways find the incorrect option interstitial fluid has the same mineral distribution as that in the plasma very true 
the fluid present in the lymphatic system is lymph true proteins are absorbed through lymph in the lactyls present in the intestinal villi no guys not proteins lipids or fats so this is incorrect fourth lymph is a colorless fluid containing specialized lymphocyte this is also true so answer to this question will be three okay next circulatory pathways let's talk about the circulatory pathways guys for understanding the various types of circulatory pathways you need to know various types of hearts let's get started so if i talk about the types of hearts first in the entire animal kingdom in the entire animal kingdom so what are the various types of heart first of all we have two chambered heart we have three chambered heart and then we have four chambered heart okay so the four chamber looks like this which is our heart three chamber looks little like this and two chambers look like this okay this is how it looks like all right so i'm heading i'm getting a cute headache due to this rubber band because i have no habit of making ponies all the time i get headache yeah you know earlier i have i used to make ponies but like since so much time i'm not making it so i'm getting the headache oh my god <laughs> so anyway so let's get continued with this so we say that hearts are of three types two three and four chamber so two chamber heart have two uh, chambers definitely so one chamber is auricle and another is ventricle so here in this heart whatever blood is flowing will be deoxygenated so from the tissues deoxygenated blood will come enter into the auricles and leave the uh, and leave from the ventricles and enters to the gills now you got it right which animal i'm talking about fishes so two chamber heart is present in fishes here because blood is passing only once through the heart and that blood is deoxygenated only so you call this type of circulation as single circulation in single circulation guys blood passes once through the heart blood passes once through the heart once through the heart okay second three chambered heart in three chamber heart imagine this is the right auricle this is the left auricle and this is one ventricle they have you all understand na? auricles and ventricles okay so here the blood that enters here is deoxygenated and here the blood is oxygenated imagine this is oxygenated blood and this is deoxygenated blood so when blood enters into the ventricles the blood is of a mixed kind so here the blood enters twice through the heart when it it was deoxygenated another it was oxygenated but in ventricles it got mixed in ventricles it got mixed in fourth chamber the blood that passes or that comes here is for example deoxygenated here the blood is oxygenated and ventricles left one will also carry oxygenated and the right one cause uh, right one will carry deoxygenated so both these types of blood will be pumped out separately they are not getting mixed so here the blood passes twice through the heart once when it was deoxygenated second when it was oxygenated here blood is coming differently but here it got mixed so you call this circulation as incomplete double and this as double circulation in double circulation blood passes twice through the heart here also blood is trying to pass twice through the heart but in ventricles it got mixed so that's why it is not a complete double so you call it as incomplete double circulation so this one is usually seen in the amphibians and reptiles amphibians and reptiles so what type of it this is incomplete double and this one is found 
in crocodile crocodile is a reptile so it's an exception in reptiles because reptiles have four chambered heart okay so in apes and in mammals so this type of circulation is double circulation the blood passes twice through the heart blood passes twice through the heart okay now let's talk about some other classification of types of heart now you say ma'am more very true yeah there are so we have two types of heart one are myogenic heart another are neurogenic heart another are neurogenic so we have one heart which is neurogenic imagine this is a neurogenic heart and we have heart myogenic so both have to start beating they both need to beat okay heartbeat right so we need an impulse or a current so that the heart should beat we need a current that a heart should beat so the neurogenic heart will start its heartbeat only when the nerves will come and tell this heart to beat or we say there is a nerve innervation nerve impulse will come or a current from nerve will come and that will tell the heart to initiate its heartbeat so we say in neurogenic heart the nerve impulse initiates the heartbeat right nerve impulse or the neurons are innervated the nerve impulse initiate the heartbeat okay now what about myogenic in myogenic myo means muscle heart's muscle they are very much developed heart's muscles they are very much developed these muscles know how to generate a current just like nerves these muscles know how to generate the current just like nerves so this uh, muscles will generate the current just like of nerves and we say that the heart beat is initiated by heart muscles heart beat is initiated by heart muscles so this type of a heart is myogenic so myogenic heart is seen in the vertebrates whereas in the in the invertebrates you will see neurogenic heart okay now another type of circulation like we have done the single circulation double incomplete there is one more type of circulation on the basis of networks of blood vessels okay so what's that type of a circulation so that's open and close so circulation can be of a circulatory pathways can be of further two type one is close another is open so you must have heard of cockroach in cockroach there is no blood vessels no blood capillary networks heart can be present or heart is definitely present in the cockroach but if you have seen i have not taught you any blood vessel in the cockroach so all the blood is present in an open cavity you call it as hemocele imagine if we have heart but no blood vessel so the entire blood is present in the cavities inside our body right so but this does not happen in us we have blood vessels so that type of a circulation is close in close type of circulation in close type of circulation the blood vessels are highly developed the blood vessels are highly developed they are highly developed but here blood vessels are not developed or even not sometimes present heart is never a criteria heart can be present in the open circulatory system here the blood is present in sinuses or open cavities or open cavities so what's the benefit of having a blood vessel first of all it becomes efficient the blood vessels will give blood to the entire tissues they are distributed according to tissues so entire tissues will get the blood second thing the blood vessel or have a pressure so the blood will flow in more pressure so that's why we say that this close one is more efficient this one is more efficient than the open one fine so where do you find the open circulatory system you find it in the arthropoda and mollusca 
and you find this one in the analida and core data analida and core data fine all right so let's talk about this paragraph which we have just done right now first the circulatory patterns are of two type open and close open circulatory system is present in arthropod and mollusk in which blood pumped by the heart passes through a large vessel into open spaces or body cavities called sinuses so as i've told you the blood vessels are not fully developed so the large vessels are only present like in uh, the case of cockroach we have iota and they ultimately open uh, the blood enters into open cavities known as sinuses okay then Analytes and chordates have a closed circulatory system in which the blood pumped by the heart is always circulated through a closed network of blood vessel. This pattern is considered to be more advantageous as a fluid or the flow of fluid can be more precisely regulated. How it is regulated? It is giving to the tissues. All vertebrates possesses a muscular chambered heart. Fishes have two chamber heart with an atrium and ventricle. Atrium is the another name for oracle. Okay. Amphibians and the reptiles, except crocodiles, have three chambered heart with two atria and single ventricle. Whereas crocodile birds and mammals possesses a four chambered heart with two atria and two ventricles. In fishes, the heart pumps out which blood? Always deoxygenated, which is oxygenated by the gills and supplied to the body part from where deoxygenated blood is returned to the heart. So, this type of circulation is single circulation. In amphibians and reptiles, the left atrium receives oxygenated blood from the gills or lungs or skin, and the right atrium gets the deoxygenated blood from the other body parts. Always, always deoxygenated bloods come from tissues or body parts. Okay. However, they get mixed up in the single ventricle which pumps out mixed blood so it's incomplete double in birds and mammals oxygenated and deoxygenated blood received by the left and the right atria respectively pass on to the ventricles of the same side the ventricles pumped it out without any mixing up that is two separated circulation pathways are present in this organism hence animals have double circulation let us study the human circulatory system so that's about the entire animal kingdom it's time to study our circulatory system okay i'm just reading the ncrt with you so that you can get a habit how to read the ncrt guys okay so i am adapting you to read ncrt i'm adapting you to read ncrt if you find reading this boring do not skip it sometimes you have to do boring things to get better things in life okay <laughs> All right, next. So, first of all, do this question, then we'll move further. Three chamber heart is seen in the frog, it's amphibian. Closed circulatory system is found in annelids, open in the arthropod, and four chamber heart in the crocodile. So, match the followings are also important from NEAT point of view. You know, there are a lot of match the following questions every year in the NEAT. All right, guys. So, let's talk about, so let's talk about the structure of the heart. So first of all, how many chambers our heart is made up of? It is made up of four chambers, two atria and two ventricles. So our heart is made up of four chambers. Four chamber heart is also seen in reptiles, only crocodile. Otherwise, all reptiles have three chambered heart. Crocodile have four chamber, apes and mammals. And where we have two atria and two ventricles. So if you can see this diagram, there is right atrium, there is left atrium, there is right ventricle and there is left ventricle, right? Now, where it is present? It is present in the thoracic cavity and it is mesodermal in origin. What is mesodermal in origin? You know, when you were embryo, you had three germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm and endoderm. So your heart, it formed from mesoderm, the uh, middle layer. Then it is present in the thoracic cavity between two lungs. If these are two lungs, your heart will be present in this thoracic cavity and little tilted towards left side. So that's why we say now your heart is present on the left side. It is of a shape of a clenched fist like this. If clenched fist, in Hindi we say band mutti. So it's uh, the shape of a clenched fist which is tilted towards little left side. Right? Now, another point to note down here is that between two atria is present this wall. You call this wall as interatrial septum. And between two ventricles is present another wall known as interventricular septum. If we compare about these two septum, the interventricular is the thickest one. And these both vent uh, these septums are made up of muscles. What are they made up of? Muscles. Now, 
Also, if I compare between the wall of atria and ventricle, the ventricles, especially the left ventricle, has the thickest wall. It has the thickest wall. Why? The reason is because the left ventricle has to pump blood to the body parts. And body parts, they are important. They need oxygen. They need blood. Right? Next is, between atria and ventricle, there is another wall. This one. This is atrioventricular septum. It is not made up of uh, muscle, rather it is made up of fibrous connective tissue. So the difference between these septum, what are basically septums are, these are like walls between two rooms. Like if you have two rooms in the house, there is a wall in between them. So that is what a septum is. Okay. All right. So now if you'll see the heart externally, this was the heart structure internally. If you'll see the external portion, you can see here that your heart has these grooves, depressions or grooves. Externally, for example, when you will become a doctor, they will uh, show you the heart. So when you will see the heart externally, uh, you will see some grooves inside that, right? So there are two grooves and these grooves are known as sulcus. What do you call as sulcus? So externally, sulcus are present. Internally, septums are present. Fine? Okay. Next. Next, we have the wall of the heart. Wall of the heart. What heart is made up of? what heart is made up of so in fact uh, in the you know junior classes you must be wondering what heart is made up of you know whether it is a muscle is it as a skin what it is made up of so let's see the wall like we have did the wall of the elementary canal just like that so it is made up of basically three layers the first layer is endocardium say it with me then you know you can easily memorize it endocardium second is the myocardium and third is a pericardium from inside to outside if this is a lumen if this is a lumen i have just drawn the wall on the one side it doesn't mean it is not on the another side yes it, it will be on the other side as well so first we have is the endocardium the middle layer myocardium and the outermost pericardium you remember in the lungs we have done pleura pleura was a double layer wall around the lungs or we have done cirrhosis. it's a single layer around your gut elementary canal just like that around heart we have pericardium so let's start it from the lumen inside from inside we have endocardium and endocardium is usually made up of simple squamous epithelium what it is made up of simple squamous epithelium then we have myocardium myo means muscle it is made up of cardiac muscle what it is made up of cardiac muscle there are three types of muscles in our body if you remember or if you have attended my lecture structural organization in animals if not just go back and see there there are three types of muscles skeletal smooth and cardiac so cardiac are present in the heart and you can see this is the thickest wall myocardium is the thickest wall so basically 90 percent of your heart is made up of cardiac muscle why because the function of the heart is to pump the blood. So for that, we need muscles, right? Okay. Then pericardium is made up of two layers. One is visceral or inner layer. You can see this layer is a visceral layer. And then outer layer or the parietal layer. In between that is present a pericardial cavity which have a fluid known as pericardial fluid. Just like pleural fluid, pleural cavity. And the same function is uh, performed by these fluid here also. It reduces friction and it helps in shock absorption. All right. So that's about the wall of the heart. My dear students, let's move further and talk about a question or a solve a question. Because, you know, if you do not solve the question in between, then how will you get, come to know that whether you are uh, doing right or wrong? Or are, are you getting everything or wrong, uh, right or wrong? Right. Okay. First is heart is protected by a double walled membranous bag called. So heart has a double membranous bag, which is not pleura. Pleura is in the lungs. Pericardium is absolutely correct. And myocardium is made up of muscles. Wherever you get myo word, that is related with muscle. And wherever you got the word cardio, it is related with the heart. So answer to this question will be second. All right. Okay, next. Next, we are going to talk about the inner structure of the heart. As you all know, okay, so what you have to do is you have to draw this side by side with me okay do you have a colored pens if not you must have one pen at least so if you have colored pens that's quite uh, nice uh, use those pens and paper and your hand and let's draw a diagram with me so first of all as i say your heart is four chambered we have two atria and two ventricles we have two atria and two ventricles like this and ventricular wall is thicker 
So as you can see, septum is also thicker. So this is how the ventricle wall, it looks like. And that's the lumen of the ventricles. Okay. Now, there is an opening here between atria and ventricle. Imagine guys, imagine, okay, let me just go it slow. If this is the right atrium and this is the left atrium, then this will be right ventricle, this will be left ventricle. This is your right side of the heart. And this is the left side of the heart. See, we say that, the right side always carries deoxygenated blood. Which deoxygenated blood? And left side always carries oxygenated blood. This is what double circulation is. We say the four chamber heart in all those animals, uh, it undergoes double circulation or it shows double circulation. What is double circulation? The blood passes twice through the heart, once when it is deoxygenated and second when it is oxygenated. So our heart is getting two circulation right by side by side or it is performing two circulation side by side. One which is done by the right heart, another which is done by the left heart. Fine. Now, as I'm saying, the right side of the heart is carrying deoxygenated blood always. So from where the deoxygenated blood comes, it comes from the tissues because the tissues have undergone oxidation. They have used oxygen, they are going to produce CO2 which is going to get drained into the blood and the blood is now deoxygenated and the blood is now deoxygenated. So we say that the deoxygenated blood enters into the right atrium through the body tissues. Through what? Through body tissues like this. So there are two great big blood vessels which are bringing deoxygenated blood, which are bringing deoxygenated blood. So this one is superior, this one is superior vena cava. This is bringing the deoxygenated blood from your upper body. This is inferior vena cava. This is bringing deoxygenated blood from the uh, lower part of the body. So here deoxygenated blood is entering. Okay, here. So, deoxygenated blood. From where? From tissues. Deoxygenated blood from your tissues. Now, as you can see, there are certain openings which are opening into the right atrium. So, this opening, this one particularly, is guarded by the valve. What are valves, guys? What are valves? Valves are nothing, but these are like doors. Like when you have to shut the door. You just put a pressure and push it like hardly and the door gets shut. Just like that, valves open and close. These are nothing. These are just like doors. These are doors made up of muscles. These are doors made up of muscles. These are, they open and close uh, according to the pressure of the blood. They open and close according to the pressure of the blood. The purpose of the valves, there are doors here so that the blood do not get a backflow. For example, this is present in this manner. So it can easily come back. The blood can easily come back just like when you go above the hill and there is a lot of slope. If you do not put a brake, the car can easily move back just like that. Okay. So their valves are very much needed in the heart. Such one valve is a stachian valve. The purpose of valve is to prevent the backflow of blood. Some other valves will also come and I'll write there was the purpose so that you will not forget it for your life okay then the blood deoxygenated blood from tissues through vena cava has entered into your right atrium and now it will go into the uh, into the right ventricle the right ventricle is guarded by a valve which is a tricuspid valve that means it has three doors it has three doors so what is the name of this valve tricuspid valve since this valve is present between atria and ventricle so you call it as AV valve. It is present between atri and ventricle. You call it as AV valve. Okay. Now, this is the story of your right side. The blood, how the blood is entering into the right side of the heart. La let's talk about the left atrium. The blood from the left atrium, it enters through pulmonary vein. Uh, left atrium, right? Because the, this blood is going to be oxygenated. So from where does oxygenated blood come? Definitely from lungs. Because lungs is the organ that oxygenates the blood. So oxygenated blood from the lungs enter into the right atrium. And what is the name of the blood vessel? This is pulmonary vein. Now you must be thinking, ma'am, vein carries deoxygenated blood. This is what we have studied so far. Guys, that's absolutely true. 
veins carries the oxygenated blood and arteries carries uh, the uh, oxygenated blood but here there are two exception one is pulmonary vein another is pulmonary artery pulmonary vein carries oxygenated blood and pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood okay so now okay so the blood has entered here no problem the blood has entered now blood this oxygenated blood will enter will enter in the left left ventricle again again there is a valve but here uh, the valve will be having two doors so such type of a valve is known as bicuspid valve it is also a type of av valve and another name of this valve is a mitral valve mitral valve it's a type of a av valve okay all right so here guys uh, the how the blood enters into the heart this is what we have done now how does the blood pumps out from the heart since this is the right ventricle and right ventricle has to give blood to the because this is deoxygenated blood it has to give blood to the lungs so there is a blood vessel that is attached to the right ventricle and the name of that blood vessel okay let me just draw it with the orange color okay the name of this blood vessel is pulmonary artery what is the name of this blood vessel pulmonary artery so pulmonary artery okay i'm writing the name here pulmonary artery pulmonary artery is pumping out the deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle to the lungs where the blood is going to lungs why to lungs because the blood is deoxygenated we want to oxygenate it so it will go to the lungs and it is also guarded by the valves known as semi lunar valves similarly we have another blood vessel here aorta aorta is also guarded by semi lunar valve and this is pumping blood this is pumping blood to your to your what to your body because body needs body needs oxygenated blood so this blood vessel is aorta let me just put it down here aorta and the blood it pumps blood to body to body fine and what are the name of these valve these are semi lunar valve semi means half lunar means moon now these av valves you know they can be uh, sometimes they get move due to the pressure changes of the blood you know they can be misplaced they can move here and there so we want to keep them in place so to keep the av valves in the place there are certain cords of collagen fibers so cords of collagen fibers they are present in the ventricles like this cords of the collagen fibers they are present in the ventricles and down here they are attached to papillary muscles the only function of these uh, uh, chordae tendinae what you call these cords chordae tendinae and papillary muscle is to keep the av valves positioned because they are attached to the av valves only not to the semi lunar valves now what are these structure these are chordae tendinae chordae tendinae and these are papillary muscles these are just like uh, you know springs papillary muscles are just like strings and imagine this is a cord this is a spring and this is a valve so if the uh, if the valve is moving to upper direction this uh, muscle will contract and push it to the upper side and then bring it back just like that okay so papillary muscle and chordae tendinae chordae tendinae are made up of collagen fibers what's the purpose of uh, these both structures these both the structure they help in they help in keeping the av valves in position all right so that's the structure of your heart my dear students let's talk about some other uh, physiology part of the heart okay so first of all what the uh, heart does it pumps blood it pumps blood okay so the double circulation is a circulation that is the uh, characteristic feature of your four chamber heart right now in the double circulation two types of circulations are going on one is a pulmonary another is a systemic okay so look here so pul this circulation pulmonary circulation it starts from pulmonary artery that's why its name is the pulmonary circulation systemic circulation it starts from aorta and aorta supplies blood to your entire system system means entire body so that's why the name of systemic circulation is the systemic circulation because it supplies blood to the entire system all right so how uh, how this started so okay let me just uh, highlight the things here 
imagine this is a pulmonary artery so we are saying it starts from pulmonary artery pulmonary artery is giving blood to the lungs so from pulmonary artery the blood goes to the lungs that's absolutely correct now from the lungs the blood will go to this structure which is pulmonary vein to this structure which is pulmonary vein now this pulmonary vein will give blood to the left atrium so this circulation that is going on is your pulmonary circulation that means pulmonary artery giving blood to the lungs from lungs it goes to the pulmonary vein and then to the left atrium all right now what about systemic in systemic circulation it starts from iota you can see this is iota yes this one the iota give blood to the tissues it give blood to the tissues from tissues it goes to the vena cava and from vena cava it goes to the right atrium this is what your systemic circulation is so here it starts from pulmonary artery ends to the left atrium it starts from the aorta and ends to the right atrium these are the two type of circulation under double circulation that are going on inside your body okay so circulation are of two type one is pulmonary another is systemic now one more surprise another type of circulation that is coronary circulation now what about coronary circulation coronary circulation is a type of circulation that supplies that supplies blood to the heart blood to the heart now your heart is a pump for example in home we have pump that uh, pumps the water okay so what's the purpose of the pump it will pump the water now for uh, for the for the action of the pump or to start the pump you need electricity what do you need electricity just like that heart is a pump it has a space inside that that is lumen and lumen have blood in it okay now heart is pumping it is doing something when any tissue in your body is doing something it also need energy it also need energy and energy is produced from the oxidation of food so that this is here we ends up that heart muscles or heart tissues to live they also need nutrients and that is supplied by the blood you all know the blood supplies uh, the entire nutrients and oxygen to the tissues for example if i say my kidney needs the or my intestine needs the uh, energy for churning action or my skeletal muscle needs the uh, energy or it needs the nutrients and oxygen who will supply it blood just like the skeletal uh, muscles are getting the oxygen and nutrients from the blood just like that your cardiac muscles will also receive the blood so how it will receive so what happen your aorta aorta it's divide into arteries an artery enter the organs it enter the organs so for example arteries are of various kind one is a renal artery that goes to kidney one is a hepatic artery that goes to liver just like that we have a coronary artery so from aorta everything starts from aorta because aorta pumps oxygenated blood to the tissues from aorta arises coronary artery coronary artery supplies blood to the heart it enters heart musculature it enters heart musculature okay now it supplies blood to the heart muscles supplies blood to the heart muscles now the blood has given oxygen to the heart muscles now what the blood will become it will become deoxygenated okay so oxygen supplies to the heart muscle it is done if i say the coronary artery it goes to the tissues gives all the oxygen okay now what will happen next the blood will become deoxygenated okay now this deoxygenated blood it will goes to the blood has become deoxygenated it will go to coronary vein coronary vein this is what happen in our body this is how our body functions arteries carries oxygenated blood veins carries deoxygenated blood and coronary vein open into which atrium which atrium have deoxygenated blood guys the right atrium it will open into the right atrium so this is how it functions this is how it works okay in our body arteries arteries open into capillaries we'll do the, that in details also capillaries open into veins 
So capillaries are the one which is present near the tissues. Listen to this very carefully. Capillaries are the one which are present into the tissues and capillaries will give oxygen, will give oxygen. Okay, and take the CO2. Now this blood was oxygenated. After the capillary has exchanged the gases, the blood will become deoxygenated, which will get into veins. Just like here also, coronary artery will bring the oxygenated blood. It will open into coronary capillaries. Capillaries will give oxygen to the heart muscles and then the blood will become deoxygenated, which will go into the veins. This is how the system is going on in the heart and this is coronary circulation. These arteries are very important. If they got accidentally blocked by something, it leads to the disorders, which we'll be discussing in the disorders part. Okay. So one such circulation is coronary. Second such circulation is hepatoportal system. Now again, what happened in a body? What happened in a body? From one organ, the blood or from any organ, the blood goes to the heart directly. For example, let me give you an example. Like we have uh, the, uh, what do you say? We have kidney. Okay. So kidney have renal artery and uh, renal vein. I'm giving you one example guys here. Like we have kidney, kidney have renal artery and renal vein, renal artery and renal vein. Artery, artery is the one which is bringing oxygenated blood from the heart, okay, from the left side of the heart. It supplies blood to the kidney and the deoxygenated blood from the vein, it goes to the heart. This is how the circulation goes on. This is what is, is, right? So what happened? The oxygenated blood from the heart, left side of the heart, left uh, side of the heart, it goes to the artery. Arteries give it to the kidney and kidney, the deoxygenated blood from the kidney through the vein, it goes to the right side of the heart. This is how the circulation goes on. So that means from one organ, the blood is directly pumped to the heart. This is what happened in normal organs, in normal organs. But sometimes in the portal system, now what are portal system? In portal systems, what happen? Organ 1, first it will supply blood to the organ 2 and then organ 2 will give the blood to the heart. For example, we have one portal system which is hepatic portal system. In hepatic portal system, in hepatic portal system, the gut or your intestine or your GIT, Gut will give blood first to the liver and from liver it will go to the heart. And this system is hepatoportal system. So in our, uh, for example, this is your intestine. Intestine and this is your liver. Intestine will give the blood first to the liver through this blood vessel. You call it as hepatoportal vein. The reason why your intestine and uh, your liver are working in this synchronized fashion hip, through hepatoportal vein, why your intestine is giving uh, the blood, the reason is that in intestine, the food is observed or absorbed, not observed, absorbed in the blood. For example, if you had alcohol. Now, alcohol is absorbed in the stomach or in the intestine, okay? So, from there, through hepatoportal vein, the alcohol will first go to the liver. So, if we'll send the entire alcohol to the heart, heart will give it to the body. An entire body will be affected by the direct alcohol. But when alcohol goes to the liver first by hepatoportal system, the alcohol get detoxified. It is converted into aldehyde by certain enzyme. We have done the liver do the detoxification stuff so that no toxin will go directly to the body. That's why nature has given us a passage where the blood will first go to the liver. In liver, it will be detoxified. The substances will be detoxified and then it will go to the heart. These are your portal system. One such portal system in your body is hepatoportal system. So this is a one kind of circulation. So one kind of circulation we have done, the special one is coronary and another is the hepatic one. Fine guys? Okay. Moving further to the next one is your NCRT. Let's read the NCRT of this paragraph. As mentioned earlier, the blood pumped by the right ventricle enters a pulmonary artery, whereas the left ventricle pumps blood into the iota. The deoxygenated blood pumped into the pulmonary artery is passed on to the lungs from where the oxygenated blood is carried carried by the pulmonary veins into the left atrium. This pathway constitutes a pulmonary circulation. So what is in the pulmonary circulation? 
pulmonary artery, then to the lungs, then to the through pulmonary vein into the left atrium. What about systemic? The oxygenated blood entering the aorta is carried by a network of arteries, arterioles and capillaries to the tissues from where the deoxygenated blood is collected by a system of venules, veins and vena cava and emptied into the right atrium. Very simple, aorta, give blood to the tissues, from tissues it will go to the vena cava and then to the right atrium. This is known as systemic circulation. The systemic circulation provides nutrients, oxygen and other essential substances to the tissues and takes CO2 and other harmful substances away for elimination. This is what we have done. You know, uh, it will give oxygen to the tissues and take away the CO2. Like uh, in renal artery, gives oxygen to the re uh, renal or kidney and then vein will take away the deoxygenated blood. A unique vascular connection exists between digestive tract and liver and it is called hepatopotal system. Hepatic portal vein carries blood from intestine to the liver before it is delivered to the systemic circulation. So, from where hepatopotal vein is carrying the blood? From intestine and then it will give it to the liver and then to the heart. And it will then become the part of systemic circulation. A special coronary system of blood vessel is present in our body exclusively for the circulation of blood to and from, from the cardiac musculature. It is known as coronary circulation. So it is also talking about a circulation that is going on in the heart also in the cardiac musculature. That means the muscles of the heart. All right. So that's about the circulation, guys. Let's move further. Solve this question for me. Hurry up. Okay. Blood vessels present in a body exclusively for the circulation of blood to and for to and from the cardiac musculature are the part of simple coronary circulation. Now, what is a renal portal system? Renal portal system is another type of a system. It is absent in human. Like in hepatic portal system, liver was the organ where the uh, where uh, your um, uh, what do you say? the blood was going on right like i have said here in the portal system the git will first give blood to the liver then to the heart it is hepatic portal in renal the lower limbs will give blood to the kidney and kidney to heart this is seen in frogs this is seen in frogs so renal is absent in human it is present present in frogs okay so what happened in the renal one lower limbs gives blood to the kidney and kidney will give blood to the heart okay apart from the hepatopotal system one another portal system that goes in the human is hypophyseal portal system this we'll be doing in the chapter chemical control hypophyseal portal system i'll just give you an idea here so this is in human in us so what happened in this one hypothalamus Hypothalamus is a part of your brain. It is an also endocrine gland. It will give blood to the pituitary. And pituitary will give blood to the heart. This is what happened here. Okay. And none of the above will not be the answer. So what will be the correct answer guys? Answer 3. Okay. Next. Let's talk about the blood vessel. What about blood vessel? So as I've told you, there is, you know, a network of blood vessels in our body. There is not only one blood vessel, but there is network of blood vessel. Let's see this diagram. So, as you can see, this is your entire circulation. Okay. So, entire circulation is only possible because we have blood vessels and they are important. So, where are, we have arteries, we have capillaries and we have veins. But the thing does not end here. We have a complex network. Let's see. So, first of all, the oxygenated blood enters into the arteries arteries are broader then arteries opens into arterioles arterioles are like arteries but a little narrower one like this Arter arterioles it opens into capillaries and capillaries are the one which are present near the tissues they are present near the tissues like this they are present near the tissues capillaries they are very thin walled they are very thin walled they are very 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 thin walled okay now these capillaries what do they do okay let me just make tissues here what these capillaries do they have oxygenated blood 
they will give oxygen to the tissues and take away co2 now the what blood have become deoxygenated arteries had oxygenated blood this oxygenated blood was going through arterioles into the capillaries capillaries they are single celled very thin okay now these capillaries will give oxygen to the tissues these are tissues and take the co2 and after that it will open into venules venules are just like vein uh, sorry arterioles right and then it will open into a broader into a broader which are veins now these venules where are they opening they are opening into venules uh, sorry venules they are opening into veins the difference between venule and vein is veins are thinner uh, sorry venules are thinner and veins are broader the difference between same arterioles and arteries arterioles are thinner arteries are broader or bigger one okay that's this is how your body works let me give you a very nice example for example guys you have this organ again i am talking about kidney this is kidney okay imagine this is your aorta a bigger blood vessel aorta is carrying oxygenated blood through I from aorta a lot of blood vessels emerges some goes to the various organs some goes to hepatic or liver some goes to intestine and some goes to like kidney here so imagine this is your renal artery this is your renal artery renal artery is bringing oxygenated blood towards the kidney towards the kidney oxygenated blood okay now this uh, artery once it has entered inside the kidney it will form small small arterioles it will form small small arterioles arterioles will then further form arterioles will further form capillaries and capillaries are the exchange vessel and they will give oxygen to the tissues it will give oxygen to the tissues and take the co2 okay once it has taken co2 they are connected with the venules small small venules these venules will now open into renal vein they will open into renal vein and where does renal vein is entering it is entering into vena cava it is entering into vena cava a lot of blood vessels enters into the vena cava one such is like your renal vein and vena cava goes to heart and this is bringing blood to the heart okay this is how the entire network is renal artery opening into renal arterioles arterioles open into the structure known as capillaries capillaries one have exchanged the gases it will open into venules venules open into renal vein and renal vein will go to vena cava this is how the entire network of blood vessel is pumping blood in your body now let's see the difference between these blood vessel first of all arteries and veins okay so first of all your arteries they are thicker walled and they are thinner walled if anything have thick wall the lumen or the space inside that will be less so we say that it have narrow lumen a lumen and this one has the wider lumen second if something is made up of thick wall will it be able to collapse will it be able to destroy and squeezed up easily no arteries are non collapsible these are collapsible if something is heavy for example if you uh, throw stone in the water will it uh, sink or it will float it will sink so if something is heavy it will sink so that's why they are deep seated if you'll see you can see green color veins on your body not red color arteries because these are thin they are superficial they are present above the surface so you can easily see these blood vessel you can see one on this my face <laughs> right the blood flows at high pressure because the wall is thick and it can easily pump the blood here the blood uh, blood flows at low pressure if the blood is flowing at pressure it will get some jerks in hindi we say dhakke lagenge right so here the blood flows in jerks and here blood flows is smooth it's going smooth like that here valves are present why do we have valves the reason to have valves here is that because the blood is flowing at low pressure so the reason can be the blood will get a back flow so to prevent the back flow to prevent back flow we have valves always valves helps in preventing the back flow even in the heart even in the veins okay arteries do not have valves now let's draw the structure of a uh, a blood vessel so for that we need to have these uh, things <laughs> okay 
So let's draw the structure of the blood vessel. All right. Okay. So the innermost layer is tunica intima. Tunica intima is made up of simple squamous epithelium. It is made up of simple squamous epithelium. So we are going to draw the wall of your uh, Okay, the wall of your blood vessel, like the way we have done the wall of your heart. Okay, so the innermost layer is tunica intima. This one is tunica intima. Tunica intima is made up of, also known as tunica interna, is made up of simple squamous epithelium. And sometime you call it as endothelium. You also call it as endothelium. Okay. Now, let's talk about the <coughs> another layer, the middle layer. The middle layer, the middle layer, okay. All right. So this is a middle layer. This middle layer is containing a lot of smooth muscle cell, which mother, uh, not mother, <laughs> muscle cell, smooth muscle cell. This layer is known as tunica media. This is known as tunica media. Apart from smooth muscle cell, guys, it also have elastic muscle fibers, you know, because the blood is pumping at, you know, uh, the pressure. And sometimes we need the elasticity. We need elasticity, the flexibility of blood vessel. So for that, nature has given us two things in the tunica media. One are elastic fibers and other are smooth muscle cells. What are these? Smooth muscle cells. And both will provide elasticity by contraction. The tunica media is thinner in the veins. This is the reason why arteries have thicker wall and veins have thinner walls. Tunica media is thinner in veins. Okay. Now the outermost layer, this one, is tunica externa. Tunica externa is having a lot of collagen fibers. Which fibers they have? They have collagen fibers. It is said that always have a lot of vitamin C in your diet. What's the reason? What's the reason? Because vitamin C helps in the formation of collagen fiber. More the collagen fibers in your matrix of skin, more firm your skin is, young looking skin is. Similarly, more vitamin C uh, is in your body, more collagen fibers and that fibers will be in the blood vessel. We say that vitamin C deficiency causes scurvy. That is bleeding gums. What happened? What happened due to that? Because when you have no vitamin C, there will be no collagen fibers and the gums blood vessel will burst and leads to bleeding, right? So that's why we say one should have a lot of vitamin C and these collagen fibers, they're abundant in tunica externa. All right, guys. So what if I talk about the capillaries? These capillaries, they are very thin walled, also known as exchange vessel. If I talk about these capillaries, if I talk about these capillaries, they have only one layer and that is tunica intima. That's why they can easily exchange the oxygen and CO2. If imagine the capillaries as thicker as artery, will it be able to exchange CO2 and O2? No. So that's why nature have called them capillaries or exchange vessel for a reason or not nature. In fact, we have named it <laughs> as capillaries and exchange vessel. Why? They are very thin and they have tunica intima only. They are just made up of simple squamous. If you have seen in the diffusion membrane also, the capillaries were present and they have only one layer that is simple squamous epithelium. Okay, so they have only one layer. That's why they are able to exchange the things. 
All right, guys, let's talk about this paragraph of NCRT. The blood flows strictly by a fixed route called blood vessel, the arteries and vein. Basically, each artery and vein consists of three layers, an inner lining of squamous endothelium, tunica intima, a middle layer of smooth muscle and elastic fiber, tunica media, an external layer of fibrous connective tissue with collagen fiber is the tunica externa. So I've told you na, that the matrix should have a lot of collagen fiber. So it is the connective tissue with collagen fibers. That's tunica externa. Tunica media is compar comparatively thin in the veins. That's why the uh, walls of the veins, they are thinner as comparison to the arteries. That's about the blood vessels. Let's talk about the question. <laughs> An inner lining of squamous endothelium present in blood vessel is known as inner lining of squamous epithelium very to tunica intima, also known as tunica interna. So answer will be fourth, both one and two. You know, some students have a habit of reading things very fastly and solve it. So for all those students, always read all the option carefully. Might be you are sure that first is right, but you would have done it right. You, have, you would have given the answer one, but you have not read all the options clearly, then your answer would be incorrect because both one and two is the correct answer. Okay. All right. Next. The find the incorrect statement, the atrium and ventricle of the same side are also separated by a thick fibrous tissue known as atrioventricular septum. This is true. Heart, the mesodermally derived organ is situated into the thoracic cavity in between two lungs. This is also correct. Tunica media is comparatively thin in the veins. This is also correct. Fourth, crocodiles, birds and mammals possesses a three-chambered heart with two atria and one ventricle. No, four-chambered heart with two atria and two ventricle. So, fourth statement is incorrect. Okay, always read the NCRT lines carefully. All these are just lines of NCRT. Next, electrical activity of the heart. Now you must be thinking, ma'am, electrical activity? Really? Yes, let's get started. All right, so our heart is myogenic, as you know. Yes, so what have we done in myogenic? We have done that the heart is not dependent upon the nerves for generating the impulse or to start its uh, heartbeat, right? So we say that just like neurons, your heart muscles also have the ability to generate an electrical current. That's true. So your heart muscles, when you were a, you were embryo in your mother's form, some of your heart muscles get specialized and they become nodal tissues. What they become? nodal tissue and they start performing the function exactly like that of neurons. So we say your heart is auto excitable, it is auto rhythmic, it is myogenic. You must have heard of one thing, if you keep the heart outside of a body, it will keep on beating for some time or until or unless it is getting all the nutrients. That's why the heart transplants are possible. Why? Because your heart it doesn't need or heart muscles, they do, they do not need any nerve impulse from outside for its excitation. All right. So we say that our human heart, heart is autorhythmic, autorhythmic or auto excitable. What does it mean? It means that it can generate, it is myogenic, it is myogenic heart. It can generate its own action potential. What is action potential, guys? You will be uh, doing that in detail in neuron, but right now I will tell you, just compare it with electricity. Imagine, sorry, imagine when you switch on the button, the electric current goes to the fan and fan starts to move. So just like that, we also need electric current for muscle contraction. Like in case of skeletal muscle, you got that uh, uh, current from the neurons. In case of heart muscle, you got that current from your heart muscles itself. How? Let's see. So in your heart, for example, this is the heart. There are nodal tissues present. What are present? Nodal tissues. Imagine this is your heart. This is the ventricle like this. In your heart, nodal tissues are present. What are nodal tissues? Nodal tissues, they are specialized muscles. These are specialized cardiac muscles. They can generate electric current. They can generate electric current. What do you call electric current here now in bio? Action potential. Action potential. Okay. So this action potential is generated in the form of depolarization. 
so if whenever i'm talking about you will you got electric current i will rather, either be using the word depolarization or i either be using the word excitation for example if i say if i say this is one nodal tissue present here and the name of this nodal tissue is san sino atrial node sino atrial node san this san is a pacemaker it's like the father of every or every nodal tissue okay that's a head that's a head that's a principle that's headmaster whatsoever so it's a pacemaker pace means speed this is the one that will generate the action potential action potential means that will generate the current when a current is generated the entire nerve fibers they got depolarized they got depolarized so here all the atrial muscle fibers they will got depolarized so it will send all the impulse to the atrials or atrium and you call it as depolarization for example if i say the electric current goes to the uh, or the electric impulse from the sn goes to the atrial muscle fiber now atrial mu muscle fiber have received the current they will become excited or i can also use the word depolarization so whenever i am using the word atrial depolarization or whenever i am using the word depolarization in sense whether it's atria or the ventricle i am talking about it has received the electric current it has become excited excitation it has become excited or there is excitation right now atrial muscles they have got the impulse they have got excited now there is presence another nodal tissue here this one is present on the right atrium on the right side of the right atrium this is right atrium this is left atrium this is right ventricle this is left ventricle okay so another nodal tissue is present on the down side of the right atrium or on the bottom of the right atrium you call it as av atrioventricular node atrioventricular node the function of atrioventricular node is to supply the current of atria towards the ventricles because after the contraction of atria the contraction of ventricles takes place so atrial atrial depolarization or ventricular depolarization means they have got the current they have become excited so after depolarization what will happen muscle contraction so the purpose of this uh, depolarization or giving current is that we need to contract the heart muscle for example san generate the action potential so it has depolarized all the atrial muscle fiber now atrial muscle fibers what will they do they will contract what they will do they will contract right just like that the impulse will now go to the avn now what avn will do it will supply the current or impulse to the other nodal tissue which are present in the ventricle in the interventricular septum this space is interventricular septum you all know that right what is this interventricular septum inside the interventricular septum is present another nodal tissue which later divides into two half the right and the left you call it as interventricular septum you call it as interventricular septum so interventricular uh, sorry interventricular node septum is the place where it is present this is interventricular node this interventricular node is divided into two parts one is the left one another is the right one which later on divides into small branch like purkinje fibers small branch like purkinje fibers what are these purkinje fibers all right this is how the current is uh, formed by sa node and it goes to the entire heart and heart got excited after excitation once it has received the impulse it becomes excited or it get, becomes depolarized then it will start contracting okay all right so this pacemaker it has the speed of average uh, 72 to 75 time per minute that means it will generate the action potential at the rate of 70 to 75 times per minute that's why our heart beat is also 70 to 75 uh, times per minute for example in 1 minute how many times it will generate the current 70 to 75 time so every time it will generate the current it will lead to the contraction of atria and ventricle and this is your one beat simple and that will be studying in the next part that is the cardiac cycle so that was electrical activity of the heart guys let's talk about the cardiac cycle what is a cardiac cycle is a cycle of the heart 
it's the cyclical events that explains about one heartbeat how does one heartbeat occurs in your body in that one heartbeat what events takes place so it tells about events in one heartbeat one heartbeat to understand this you need to understand the electrical activity that we have already done let's have a crux of it when san generate the action potential atria contract and also it will send the impulse to the avn avn will send to the bundle of his or the interventricular node you also call it as bundle of his right interventricular node is also known as bundle of his okay then it will send the impulse to the purkinje fibers and entire ventricles will contact purkinje fibers they are fastest conducting and they uh, they give impulse to the muscles which muscles muscles of ventricles they innervate the muscles of ventricle so what will happen how does a, con a heart contraction take place when san generate the action potential atria will contract it will give impulse to the ventricle ventricle will contract and this will lead to the one heartbeat and that cyclical events of one heartbeat is a cardiac cycle so in cardiac cycle there is also movement of blood due to that contraction there will also be a movement of blood so to understand that first understand some uh, terms whenever i'm talking about systole that means i'm talking about contraction whenever i'm talking about diastole that means i'm talking about relaxation okay imagine i said ventricular depolarization that means ventricles uh, got the electrical impulse i said ventricular systole the ventricles are now contracting i say ventricular uh, uh, relaxation then that is ventricular diastole so like we say ventricular depolarization opposite to the ventricular depolarization is uh, the ventricular repolarization just like we say when the depolarization occurs we got electrical impulse opposite to the depolarization is repolarization when no impulse is present in the muscle and muscle is entirely relaxing okay just opposite to that we have repolarization all right so let's get started with the cyclical events so your entire cardiac cycle is divided into diastole and systole so the first stage of cardiac cycle is when your both atria and ventricles they are relaxing that stage is known as joint diastole so the cardiac cycle starts from joint diastole listen to me very carefully from here a lot of questions are asked when your heart is relaxing that means entire heart is relaxing your uh, atria and ventricles both are relaxing at that time your av valves are open what valves are open av valves are open so uh, during joint diastole the heart is relaxing so it is at lower pressure it is at lower pressure but the blood vessels there they are at high pressure and we know that blood or air always move from area of high pressure to the low pressure so from atria passing through the atria the entire blood from the blood vessels enter into your ventricle so during joint diastole we say 70% of ventricle filling occurs 70% uh, of ventricular filling occurs in joint diastole why because the pressure is very less so the entire blood enters into your ventricles now what will happen now atria will start to contract why atria is contracting because the because the san has produced electrical current when the san produces the electrical current it leads to atrial depolarization which will lead to atrial systole for example the blood will be present in the atria also so when the atria gets squeezed up the entire blood from the atria will pour down into the ventricle so when the atrial systole occurs the rest of the blood also enters inside the ventricles so already it has 70% blood now now rest of the 30% will also add up here so when the atrial contraction stops and atrial diastole starts we say at the end of the diastole around 130 ml of blood is present in both the ventricle and you call it as end diastolic volume what is the end diastolic volume guys the volume of blood present in the ventricles after atria has started the diastole or we say after the atria has completed is systole so the 70% was entering 
the 70% of uh, blood was entering due to the relaxation of the heart. 30% is entering due to contraction of the atria. So this can also be asked, when does 30% filling of the ventricles takes place? During atrial systole or atrial contraction. Okay. Now, total 130 ml of blood is present inside each ventricle. Now, what will happen? This uh, AVN right over here, it will now send impulse to the ventricles. Now, ventricles will contract. Now, ventricles will contract. So, when the ventricles contract, you call it as ventricular systole. You call it as ventricular systole. So, during ventricular systole, your AV valves close. AV valves close. So, when you shut the door, there is a production of sound. So, that is your first heartbeat that is loved. So, during, during ventricular systole, the AV valve close. Why does AV valve close? Due to high pressure. Why there is a high pressure? Because during systole, the pressure inside your ventricle increases. And this leads to production of first heart sound. First heart sound and that is love. Is love. So, this is how you produce first heart sound. Next, the contraction of ventricles will continue and you call it as isovolumetric contraction or isovolumetric systole. That means, iso means same, same volume of blood will be pumping and meter, metric means meter, same metric or meter of length of muscle fiber will contract. Now, as a result, there will be more pressure, more pressure increase in ventricle, more pressure increases in the ventricle. All right. So, when we will compare, the pressure inside the ventricles is more than the pulmonary artery and aorta. As a result, due to high pressure, semilunar valves will open. Okay. So, pressure more increases, semilunar valve open. So, when semilunar valves open, so let me just show you with the diagram here. It will be more easier for you to understand. When semilunar valve open, this is pulmonary artery. Right. And this is aorta. This is aorta. Okay. So, we say that pressure inside the ventricle is more and pressure inside these blood vessels is less. So, as a result due to high pressure to low pressure, the blood will move inside these blood vessels and you call it as ventricular ejection. Now, what will happen? Ventricular ejection. Okay, so how much amount of blood is present inside the ventricles? 130 ml. During ventricular ejection, each ventricle will eject out 70 ml of blood. So, 70 ml of blood will be ejected from this ventricle. 70 ml will be ejected from this ventricle. So, ventricular ejection will occur. How much ml? 70 ml of blood is ejected from each ventricle. And you call this as stroke volume. You call it as stroke volume. Now, 130 ml was present. 70 ml goes out. How much is left? 60 ml is left. And you call it as end systolic volume. If 70 ml goes out, what is left? 60 ml is left. And that 60 ml is end systolic volume. End systolic volume. Okay. All right. So, if you see, uh, if you find the font to be very little, I know it's not that little, but if yes, still, then you can go and check the notes on the PW app. You will get the entire notes on that app. You can just download it. You can have a printout or you can just note it down with your hand. Okay. All right. So, now what will happen next? After that, ventricles will relax. Ventricles will relax. Now, this is the heart. And now next phase will start ventricular relaxation. You call it as ventricular diastole. So now when ventricular diastole occurs, there is decrease in the pressure in the ventricles, which will lead to the closing of which valve? Semilunar valve. Now semilunar valve will close. Like here, AV valve was closing due to high pressure. Here semilunar valve will close due to low pressure. Semilunar valves are opening due to high pressure, but they will close due to low pressure. And here semilunar valve they will close and this will lead to s2 the second heart sound which is dub which is dub if you uh, if you compare both the heart sound lub and dub dub is of the high pitch 
you can uh, hear it more clearly now same way the contraction was isovolumetric the relax relaxation will take place that is isovolumetric relaxation and now the joint diastole in this phase the atria is contracting in the entire phase the atria is relaxed in this phase the ventricular is contracting in this phase in the entire phase the ventricles are relaxed so let's talk about the time duration of ventricular systole and diastole okay or the atrial systole and diastole all right so let me make a pie chart for you for better understanding so imagine we say the cardiac cycle time duration is of 0.8 seconds the entire cardiac cycle runs for the total time duration is 0.8 second the joint diastole it takes place for around 0.4 second or it occurs for 0.4 second whereas atrial systole atrial systole it occurs for 0.1 second and ventricular systole it occurs for 0.3 second okay so if ventricles are contracting for 0.3 second in this entire time the ventricles are relaxing that is ventricular diastole so ventricular diastole takes place for 0.5 second similarly if atrial systole is for 0.1 second the atrial diastole is for how much time from right here to this one atrial diastole is for 0.7 second now where does the first heart sound is produced during beginning of atria uh, sorry during beginning of ventricle systole so here s1 first heart sound is formed and here where the diastole start second heart, heart sound is formed first heart sound is formed due to uh, av valve closure due to high pressure and uh, the sound is lub s2 occurs due to semi lunar valve closure and due to low pressure okay and the sound is dub out of this which one is high pitched the dub so if someone ask you the first heart sound is produced during beginning of the ventricular systole this is absolutely correct okay so that's about your cardiac cycle guys let's solve some questions but before that uh, let's talk about one more thing that is cardiac output what is cardiac output it is the amount of blood amount of blood pumped by each ventricle in one minute how much blood is pumped by one ventricle in one minute is your is your cardiac output so its formula is stroke volume into heart beats per minute or you also call it as heart rate you also call it as heart rate all right so stroke volume is 70 ml and you multiply with 72 to 75 you take any value okay because heart rate is 72 72 uh, 72 to 75 times per minute so that will be around 5 liter per minute so we say that in one minute your heart pumps out 5 liter of blood so this is approximately the total amount of blood how much amount of blood do you have in your body 5 liter so the 5 liter blood is pumped out by your heart in one minute that means your entire blood gets pumped out in one minute okay see how beautiful it is all right guys let's talk about the control of heartbeat so can we control our heartbeat okay sometimes whenever you are in fear your heart rate start uh, heart rate rises yes or your heart rate it increases whenever you are in fear your heart rate increases isn't it yes okay how does it happen so we'll start from your brain in brain we have our cardiovascular center in the medulla so in the brain's hind brain there is a portion known as medulla oblongata and that medulla oblongata have a lot of center one such center is a cardiovascular center in cardiovascular center there are two types of center one is inhibitory center and another is excitatory center inhibitory and excitatory excitatory inhibitory always uh, always decreases the heartbeat 
and excitatory because excitation is going on depolarization current is there it will increase the heartbeat okay so what happened with this inhibitory area are attached certain neurons neurons of parasympathetic nervous system of parasympathetic nervous system so these are parasympathetic neurons these neurons they will go to sa node and what they will do they will decrease the heart rate they will decrease the heart rate okay what they will do how they will decrease the heart rate they will go to sa node and they will start repolarization why repolarization what is repolarization depolarization was when you switch on the current goes and the fan it moves that's a depolarization the current that goes what if you switch off the fan now whatever is happening inside the uh, your wires that is repolarization the switch off mode is repolarization the switch on mode is a depolarization okay now how does excitatory work excitatory send the neurons of the sympathetic nervous system there are two types of uh, nervous system in your body one is uh, sympathetic another is parasympathetic and both work opposite to each other sympathetic works whenever you are into condition of adrenaline rush right for example flight and fight response at that time the sympathetic nervous system works so that's how when you are excited that means whenever you are in fight and fight response at that time your heart beat fast or when you are fearful your heart rate fast if you can see right what happened that time sympathetic neurons goes to sa node and what they will do they will increase the depolarization so more the depolarization more the heart rate apart from that as i've told you during flight and fight response the heart rate increases so your gland adrenal gland in adrenal gland we have a gland or a portion which is medulla that secretes the hormone adrenaline adrenaline hormone also known as epinephrine and another hormone is norepinephrine or noradrenaline they also increases the heart rate how because they also are innervated by sympathetic neurons so they also increases the heart rate okay so for example uh, you know a dog is behind you and running at that time your your adrenal medulla will release these hormones these hormones are adrenaline and noradrenaline these hormones will go to these neurons and it will excite the sa node that's how it works so all these things sympathetic response and adrenal gland it they increases the heart rate and parasympathetic it decreases the heart rate all right so now let's talk about a very important topic that is ecg or ekg so you have seen that in movies no in movies you have seen uh, the a patient lying in the icu and there is a monitor and there is a waves going on pp 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 like that right you always see that in movies always right go to any movies if there is a death scene they will show that okay so what happened in this one this basically tells the electrical activity of heart when we got to know our heart can pump or, or our heart can generate the electric impulse when we got to know our heart can generate the electrical impulse so scientists thought if it has electric current let's use physics its instrument and detect how much amount of current is there so that waves you see that is basically it's a graph it's a graph that is plotted between time and the volts that voltage that is okay so basically ecg is full form is electrocardiogram electrocardiogram is a piece of paper that you get and on which these waves are formed an electrocardiograph is a machine so most of you get confused usually you have heard graph is a paper no here graph is a machine okay so how do you detect or how for example if we if you want to see my electrical activity of heart now what will you do you will apply some leads on my body one lead will be on the left wrist another on the right wrist and another the third one on the left ankle three leads are used when you usually do a standard a normal ecg for example you go to some people and you ask them about you know packages so you say okay this one is uh, 
you if you want to go ecg with three leads this is for 500 rupees if you want to uh, you if you want a specialized ecg with nine leads it's for 1200 or 1500 package just like that right so here whenever we are going for a standard ecg like a normal ecg standard or normal ecg the doctor or that expert will apply three leads on our body why we need leads because these leads will detect the current two on the wrist and one on left ankle okay so on each lift uh, wrist left and right okay then if you want a more special ecg if you want a special ecg at that time these three leads will be applied plus six on chest all right so this is how you detect the electrical current now these leads will pick up the current whatsoever it is uh, pumped by or whatsoever is generated by the heart now when your heart for example if you remember this is how we have made the electrical activities nodal tissue for example sa node generate the action potential which will lead to the depolarization of the atria this is the first step that happens so when the atrial depolarization occurs at that time one wave which is a p wave will be formed so whenever an ecg p wave is formed it tells about atrial depolarization it tells about atrial depolarization or excitation so it tells that here it tells that here atrial systole occurs at p waves atrial systole it starts QRS is not just one wave, it is a combination of waves, so you call it as QRS complex, QRS complex. During QRS complex, ventricular depolarization starts, ventricular depolarization or excitation. So we say that as soon as the ventricular depolarization starts, right after Q wave is formed, the ventricular systole starts. So we say that right after Q, right after Q. The ventricular systole starts. Right? Here, as soon as the atrial depolarization starts, the systole will also start. Why? Because SA node is present very near to the atrias. So, electric impulse is the, uh, uh, the, or we can say the passage of electrical impulse will be very faster. But here, the first impulse will go to the AV node, then, then, then to the bundle of his, then to the Purkinje fibers. So when depolarization occurs, right after some time, around 0.1 second, the ventricular systole start. So we say QRS tells ventricular depolarization, but the systole starts right after Q, not on Q, right after Q. Okay. Now, what does T wave uh, tells? T wave tells about ventricular repolarization, ventricular repolarization, and we say that. At T wave or at the end of T wave, the ventricular systole, it ends. So, when the T waves come or uh, at the end of T wave, ventricular systole ends. Okay. So, this portion is basically of a ventricular systole and this portion is of the ventricular depolarization. So, a lot of time difference is there in the ventricular systole and depolarization. The reason is that because when you switch off, for example, I say in T wave here, in T wave ventricular repolarization starts but systole ends here. Ventricular systole. Systole means contraction. Repolarization means stoppage of electrical current. So, what happened when you switch off the button of a fan? The electrical impulse stop, but the fan is keep on moving until or unless it will stop itself. Just like that. The, at the end of T wave, the repolarization has ended, but the fan is still low. The muscles are still contracting. That's why here the repolarization starts, but up to here the ventricular systole goes on. Just like that okay so that's about the ecg why do we do ecg whenever we have a complaint that might be a person is affecting or suffering from disorder we undergo ecg so if any of the wave is disturbed for example in normal ecg p wave is here but in some ecg p waves come to this place so that means a person may be suffering from a particular kind of a disease so that's why to check out the diseases we uh, have to undergo ecg all right so we can also count the number of beats by ecg how by counting qrs complex so if you count the number of qrs complex per minute you can also get the heartbeat of a person all right guys so that's about ecg 
let's talk about the disorders the first disorder we have here is hypertension tension exam tension 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 what is hyper more why do we have tension we have hyper hyper means more tension see some people who are obese or who are eating lot of junk food a lot of fat or they are smoking so much in such kind of people there can be a case of high blood pressure or sustained high blood pressure you call it as hypertension to understand hypertension let understand what is a blood pressure blood pressure is the pressure of blood on the main arteries for example heart pump the blood with high pressure so that pressure is exerted on the walls of the arteries if this is artery the pressure is exerted on the walls of the artery you call it as blood pressure okay so what is a blood pressure the pressure of the blood exerted on arteries why due to pumping action of heart due to pumping action of heart okay now what happened whenever the heart contracts that means it undergoes a stall we have one pressure when the heart relaxes we have another pressure that is diastole so systolic is a contracting pressure of the heart when the heart is contracting and diastolic when the heart is relaxing so when the heart is contracting it will push the blood at high pressure so this value is more so that is 120 mm of mercury and when it is relaxing it will not push the blood at high pressure so it is less so normal person's blood pressure is 120 per 80 mm of mercury you can see but when for longer duration the person's blood pressure is over 140 or 90 or higher it shows hypertension so person should get checks after some duration high blood pressure leads to heart disease and it also affects the brain and kidney so if there is a sustained high pressure the capillaries can burst and when the capillaries burst the organ damage can take place that's why do not worry never worry just do your hard work there is nothing more than your body just imagine if you you get worried you get hypertension your capillaries burst is a, is is there anything in the life more than your capillaries your blood vessels your own body's blood vessel no right okay so that's one disorder next we have is atherosclerosis now what happened imagine this is your coronary artery you are a fan of junk food fried food a fried food who is rich or which is rich in cholesterol so this cholesterol when you will eat it will deposit in your blood vessel okay it deposit in your blood vessel and it will also attract other substances like calcium ion and some cells like platelets and this will lead to the formation of this structure known as plaque what do you call it as plaque this structure is plaque so when you eat a lot of cholesterol that gets deposit in the main artery that is coronary artery and form a structure known as plaque now the blood was coming here and here a blockage is there okay the lumen gets narrower lumen gets narrower why because you have got a blockage and imagine this was a coronary artery and supplies to heart muscles that supplies to heart muscles so will heart muscles get any of the nutrient if it is it will get very few nutrient so in atherosclerosis there is a blockage of coronary artery that's why you call it as coronary artery disease and that blockage can lead to the death of your heart muscles because during blockage the supply to the heart muscle will be shut down and there will be less oxygen condition and that less oxygen condition is known as myocardial ischemia do you get my point or not for example a person is suffering from cad cad this thing this is known as cad coronary artery disease referred to as atherosclerosis affects the vessels that supply blood to the heart muscle it is caused by deposit of calcium fat cholesterol and fibrous tissue which make the arteries lumen narrower okay a person suffers from that then what will happen there will be no supply to heart muscle okay if there is no supply to heart muscle there will be low oxygen condition 
in the heart muscle and that condition is known as myocardial ischemia what is myocardial ischemia low oxygen in the heart muscle now what will happen next due to that the heart muscle dies heart muscle dies you call it as myocardial infarction myocardial infarction what is myocardial infarction death of heart muscle myocardial ischemia low oxygen in the heart muscle now what will happen a person will start feeling a pain which is known as angina pectoris this is a pain this pain starts or it occurs in the left part of the chest why there is a pain the muscles are dying if your cramps occur in the skeletal muscle how much it pains na imagine your heart muscles are dying that pain will start from the left chest and goes to the left arm this is a symptom of heart attack now a person is getting heart attack in heart attack only few portion of the heart muscle dies so there can be a chances of revival a person can get back right but what if a person undergo cardiac arrest for example a person is undergoing heart attack and does not get any medical uh, you know uh, any medical emergency conditions for example a person got heart attack and it is alone in the house nobody is there the person heart muscles are dying but if you take that person to the doctor might be that person will be alive again okay but what if nobody is there in the house the heart attack is going on and maybe the person's heart will start uh, to uh, the heart muscle will die more because no the medical uh, the medical uh, services are given and then the heart attack or completely heart muscles they will die that will lead to cardiac arrest so sometime heart attack can lead to cardiac arrest what is cardiac arrest complete stoppage of heart the heart muscles completely die and heart is not at all beating okay so heart attack is different from cardiac arrest let's see how so there are three terms one is heart failure one is cardiac arrest and another is heart attack that we have done already okay now heart failure is a uh, is the means of the state of the heart is not pumping blood effectively enough to meet the needs of a body heart failure is usually seen in those people who are very old aged people it's usually seen in aged people the heart is also aged the tissues they are you know getting aged and they are not rejuvenating right so at that time your heart is also old heart is also old it is pumping sometimes it is pumping effectively sometimes it is not pumping effectively so that is heart failure in heart failure the heart is not pumping the blood effectively as a result the blood will not go to the lungs and the lungs will collapse and you call it as congestion congestive heart failure because congestion of the lungs is one of the main symptom of heart failure okay so if someone uh, is coming and because of the heart disease and you see the patient's uh, blood is uh, heart is not pumping blood effectively and also the lungs are congesting what you will say the person might have got heart failure now heart failure is not as same as cardiac arrest when the heart stops beating or heart attack when the heart muscle is suddenly damaged by inadequate blood supply that we have already discussed arrest is a complete arrest means arrest you stop complete stoppage of the heart in attack you do not get the blood supply properly okay all right so let's talk about angina also in detail angina pectoris a symptom of acute chest pain appears when no enough oxygen is reaching the heart muscle and that's myocardial ischemia in case of heart attack angina can occur in men and women of any age but it is more common among middle age and elderly what are middle age people around 40 50 60 of age it occurs due to conditions that affects the blood flow and it occurs due to cad coronary artery disease so one should always get the proper checks during their middle age uh, you know you should know what are you eating you should eat clean and you should also undergo all those tests if you feel sometimes you are getting hypertension because hypertension can be the first symptom of cad all right okay so next we have certain questions guys a symptom of acute chest pain appears when no enough oxygen is reaching the heart muscle it is known as angina they if they have mentioned the word chest pain straight away put the angina okay next cardiovascular center is present in pons cerebellum medulla cardiovascular center is in the medulla in fact vomiting center in the medulla respiratory rhythm center in the medulla in pons we have pneumotaxic center next 
the end of t wave marks the end of so when in p wave is formed then q r s is formed and then t wave is formed so i have told you t wave represents ventricular repolarization okay so when t wave ends ventricular systole ends so end of t wave represents end of ventricular systole t waves represent ventricular repolarization end of t wave ventricular systole because from here now ventricular relaxation will start okay next find the incorrect one adrenal medullary hormones can also increase the cardiac output this is very true how if adrenal hormone adrenaline increases the heart rate cardiac output is stroke volume into heart rate so yes we can also increase the cardiac output athletics or athletes who runs fast to do exercise they by by uh, you know everyday exercises they increases their cardiac output that's important for them because whenever they have to perform if the cardiac output is more 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 blood is pumped more uh, uh, tissues are getting the oxygen a patch of this tissues present in the right upper corner of the right atrium called the sino atrial node very true sn is present at the right upper corner here on the right ventricle in heart failure the heart muscle is suddenly damaged by inadequate blood supply true in uh, sorry in heart failure this is not true this is wrong in heart failure the pumping action of the heart is not correct okay so if it would be heart attack then it would be correct the p wave represents electrical excitation of atria this is also true so answer to this question is 3 so it is telling about the heart attack not the heart failure in heart failure the pumping action of heart it reduces next what would be the heart rate of a person if the cardiac output is 5 liter okay so they have mentioned the cardiac output 5 liter or 5000 ml blood volume in the ventricles at the end of diastole is 100 so end diastolic volume is 100 ml and at the end of ventricular systole is 50 ml that means it is saying only 50 ml is left after the ventricular ejection so how much goes out is 50 ml how 100 minus 50 you get it or not if i say at the end of diastole entire 100 ml was filled in the ventricle after ventricular ejection ejection only 50 ml is left then how much goes out that is the stroke volume how much goes out 100 minus 50 that is 50 ml yes so here we got stroke volume that is 50 we need to find the heart rate and that will be 500 by 5 100 beats per minute so answer is 1 you got it or not it is saying at the end of diastole which we were we have taken 130 ml that is 100 and at the end of the ventricular systole is 50 ml which we have taken 60 and systolic volume they have given us 50 then what will be the stroke volume 100 minus 50 okay all right next we have is thank you so that's it about body fluids and circulation i hope you will get it and you will study it nicely read the ncert solve more 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 questions and uh, we'll keep on uh, sending more videos for you and let me know in comments are you making notes or not i want to know how many are you are taking these lectures very seriously studying from them and getting good scores in the school or whatsoever you are performing and i will be very you know glad to know that as well and also tell me from where do you belong and that's really important for me and uh, i really want to get you know who you are and uh, you know how how much uh, you know that's a kind of a relationship i want to build between us because uh, without that you know what's a teacher student relationship if there is no you know a uh, uh, teacher student relationship uh, then you know nothing works out better in a better way so anything uh, you need to know anything you have problems in or anything you you want extra you just put that in comments and we'll try to take it out right so that's all about body fluids and circulation i'll meet you in the next class bye bye take care lots of love